Um, for people that don't know who you are, why don't you like give yourself a brief, give us like a background of like how you got into this um, and like where you came from and all that. Yeah. So uh, my name is Luke Caverns. I'm an anthropologist uh, that studies sort of the origins of civilization, but I'm kind of like a rogue anthropologist. I'm not going to go work for a university. I'm not going to work for a big college or anything like that. <clears throat> but um, yeah, the way that that started was I grew up hearing about uh, stories that my family had been involved in. So on my dad's side of the family, uh, in the 1890s, there's this great legend of this, uh, it's called the Bill Kelly Mine, or it's like, it's like the lost gold of Bill Kelly. And so my family, they had this, uh, this big farm out in Dryden, Texas. This is West Texas. Um, and so there's this place out there called Reagan Canyon. That was my, that's my family's last name. Um, and so they, Reagan Canyon is where Spanish troops would pass through the Rio Grande River and come up into West Texas on their way to sites like New Mexico. Uh, and sometimes they would pass through there and eventually head back over east towards San Antonio because there's a lot of cattle uh, being driven through there. And that's what they were involved in was, was cattle. Um, but they end up finding this young boy, uh, this young He's like a half African-American, half Mexican uh, boy who comes through uh, riding a mule and he doesn't have a family. He has no place to go. So he becomes um, like a, a, an indentured worker for, for my family back then. You know, this is late 1800s. So, you know, right. they don't have the same moral that we have today necessarily. <laughs> and so, um, but they take him in, they treat him like family and everything. <clears throat> and while he was out herding cattle and I think he they had goats as well, he finds this he finds this lost gold mine. So I, I won't sit on this for too long, but they spent from the 1890s through probably the Great Depression kind of shut it down because uh, life got so hard and people couldn't live out and dried in Texas anymore during the Great Depression. Uh, there's this 40 year quest of my family and other people who are involved looking for these lost gold mines. And it's it's it kind of gets twisted up because when the Spanish were bringing gold through that Reagan Canyon, there would be bandits in there that would stop these uh, that would stop these Spanish patrols, take all their loot, bring it up into the mountains, and hide it up there. So there have been people. I've seen photos. Uh, I don't have photos of it with me today, but there are photos of people who go out and they see these. They look like rocks, but when you go up onto it, it ends up being like these wooden cases that have fallen in, and they open the case, and there's all kinds of like Spanish treasure items, identification of. I don't know, Spanish military leaders that were on these caravans. And so these bandits would drag it up into the mountains and hope to come back later for whatever reason they never would. So my family from the 1890s was big into cattle in West Texas and in their spare time searching for lost Spanish gold because it was just happening in that area. So they get involved in oil. They made some money. They made quite a lot of money in oil in the early 1900s. My dad's father is then born. He steps into the oil business and he uses the oil business as a means to fund, you know, because he becomes captivated with searching for lost treasures in like the Southwest American areas. And he becomes captivated looking for lost treasures, lost cities, lost Spanish gold. And so he uses his gold mining operation and oil operation as a means to do that. So he goes out into New Mexico in the 1950s and he finds the seven lost Spanish gold mines, which was this legend that had been around for 60 years before that. So from the 1890s as well, there were seven lost Spanish gold mines out in the deserts of New Mexico that people have been looking for. He found them and he found old Spanish sites there. And then he even concluded that there may have been uh, Mogollon, which is the, it's the ancient indigenous culture that would have lived there from maybe uh, 1000 BC up until 1000 AD. So about 2000 years, the Mogollon people would have lived there. Well, it's, it's thought, even though there hasn't been any archeologist or geologists out there to conclude this. This is just what him as an amateur archaeologist, uh, he probably would have been more closely to like an antiquarian, just somebody who had a lot of money who was into ancient history. 
And, uh, but he thought that maybe the Mogollon people were mining things out there as well. Well, he rediscovers these mines and he opens up something called the Three Bells Mining Company. And so for, for eight years from 1955 to 1963, he's running this big gold mining operation out there in the desert. And it's kind of like a hidden location. Well, a smelter explodes, somebody dies, shrapnel goes flying everywhere. His partner runs off with all the money and he lost everything. And, um, and in the fallout of that immense poverty, they had nothing. I mean, they, they, went from, they went from one of the wealthiest families in East Texas that they had like eventually ended up in, in Palestine, Texas. They were the wealthiest family in East Texas to being one of the poorest families, just like that. And, uh, you know, there were just some not very smart decisions that were made during that whole gold mining process, but they lost everything. Well, my dad was born in the fallout of that poverty. And so my dad never witnessed any of the, any of the wealth that they had, but grew up hearing about, you know, these lost treasures and everything. And I grew up hearing about that as well. And then I guess on the other side, on my mother's side, my, uh, my grandpa, he was a pastor, but also into the ancient history of the Bible. So growing up, I, I learned a lot about ancient history from my mother's side and then kind of seeking gold, seeking treasure, being an adventurer, being an explorer from my father's side. And so I grew up hearing about all this. And so from as early as I can remember, these were the first stories I was ever being told. Well, all these years later, I end up, I, I pursue some other uh, career ideas. None of them really pan out. And in the back of my mind, in spite of everything, I cannot get away from like the allure of ancient civilizations, you know? And the reason I pushed it off is just because, I mean, how do you make a living doing that? You know, I mean, a lot of these guys are, are dirt broke who, who study ancient civilizations. How do you, you know, turn that into a good, semi-prosperous life, right? But in spite of everything, I, I couldn't get away from it. And uh, so eventually went to school, got my degree in anthropology. And last year, um, my dad and I are talking at the beginning of the year as I'm really, as my channels are starting to take off. And I tell him, I'm like, I'm like, dad, I want to go find those, those mining camps that he had, the, the, the camps that are way out in the desert. And he had these, um, I had seen them growing up, but really just started looking at them maybe about two years ago. My grandfather, who was in New Mexico, he had maps of all the mines where they were mapped out and everything, but he had no GPS coordinates on the map. It was all hidden because he knew one day he wanted to go back out there and, and reopen up the mines. And so he, he blew in a bunch of the mines, like, like you know, uh, blew in the, uh, the mouth of the mines, collapsed them so that other people couldn't go in there because they were rich gold veins that are just sticking out. I mean, it was, one of the, it was one of the richest gold mines in New Mexico at the time, in Southwest New Mexico. And so I spent the better part of nine months scanning uh, satellite photography to try to find according to this 1955 map of the region, I was going on satellite photography and satellite imaging, trying to figure out where it, where it was. I eventually found it. And this time last year, I was getting ready to go out there. And so I went out there and I found it in person and explored the mines and everything. Uh, the infrastructure was all still there. Uh, we went metal detecting in the rivers like 100 yards away and we found debris from the blast that had exploded and destroyed my family's wealth found debris from the blast, went down into the mines. We found mines with openings that are, you know, half the size of this room that are so deep that, you know, you lean over and look down and you can never see the bottom. And uh, probably about, in all, there ended up being about 40 mines out there and we only saw half of the whole property. So anyways, that's kind of my upbringing and my background and, and where I come from. And all of that leaded me to being into ancient history, but not necessarily looking for Spanish gold. I kind of started in ancient, looking for, um, I kind of started being interested in ancient Egypt, but like we were talking about last night, mm -hmm. Egypt is not as accessible to me. I just didn't, don't have the funds to go there. hadn't had the funds to go there. And so learned as much as I could about Egypt. And then I became interested in the Americas because, you know, I could just fly to Mexico. And so I got wrapped up in all of that and started making videos about it, maybe about just about two years ago, I started making videos after years of studying. And I thought that maybe making videos would be a better route than being an archeologist working for a university, being told what I have to do. If I could build a life 
where I was talking to people about ancient history, maybe that could afford me the ability to, to pay my bills, to support my wife and my dog and be able to travel as well you know so that's where i'm at now that's incredible and i was kind of shocked last night at dinner when you told me there's no way that the egyptians did not build the pyramids <laughs> because i just got done talking to randall and ben for the last three days and basically everything that they show is evidence for the pyramids being built before the younger dryas cataclysm really well, and and the fact that the ancient all the evidence with the hieroglyphs and the perfect symmetry and the amazing mm -hmm. construction is like it's impossible that they did, they did that with copper chisels and pounding stones that's true okay so when i say that my point of view <clears throat> i think that there are other sites in the world that that definitely allude to the idea that there's a lost civilization that dates back you know, as far as, as far as during, the, around the time of the Ice Age. My personal opinion, I don't think that the uh, pyramids in Egypt are the best example of that. I'd love to see what, what they present. I mean, because these guys, I mean, they study that specifically. But from my point of view, as a guy who's never been there, I, like I was telling you last night, I'm an anthropologist as well. So I'm not only a skeptic, I'm also uh, classically trained is like a fancy way of, of saying that. But I studied it in school. And so, from that point of view, you approach Egyptology and you study, well, what does Egyptology actually say? And you get it. I mean, they, they, a lot of these guys are pretty excellent. But when you look at, I guess from my point of view, when you look at the bent pyramid and uh, you, look at the, you look at the chambers inside of it, at the, on the ceilings of the chambers, like I was telling you yesterday, they used, they think that it was uh, the Pharaoh Senefru, which there's a, there's a really compelling piece of evidence for that. It's not coming to mind right now as to why he built the pyramid of, of my doom, the bent pyramid and the red pyramid, which the red pyramid is the first great pyramid. That's smooth. That's like a perfect pyramid. Um, so Wait, is, that's the red pyramid. That's the red pyramid. Yeah. It's the red pyramid in the deserts of Dashur. And so, you know, people look at the three great pyramids on the Giza Plateau. So you have Khufu's Pyramid, Khafre, and then Menkure. And so this is a lineage of kings. But, and you know, those are like the straight-sided pyramids with the casing stones. There was one before that. There was a perfect one right before that. And it's called the Red Pyramid. And it's made out of a, a type of limestone that when the sun hits it, it's like, it's like beaming red. And, uh, and Steve, so, maybe you can find some images of this. Yeah, How yeah. How close is that to the Giza Plateau? I think it's I think it's like 15 miles south of the Giza Plateau, okay. or maybe it's like 50 miles south. It's okay. not, you know, it's it's kind of in that area, but it's not right next to it. And we know that the mm -hmm. Red Pyramid is older. How? I think that I think that they, I think that they date it due to like biological material or natural material that was there that was carbon dated. Plus, you also have relative dating. So you look at like, you know, th all throughout the ancient world, the reason that. So like according to classical archaeology, the reason that pottery and art is so important is because they will find somewhere they'll find pottery alongside a burial tomb in Egypt. And so you learn relative dating, right? So you learn that, okay, we can test this guy's body, the things that were in his tomb, look at the pottery, look at the art that was in his tomb. And so it's all relative dating. You're comparing things to each other. But I should say... Yeah. Oh, look, this is a wild graph. You can yeah. hover over it and it shows you. So what are the numbers next to them? There's like three, two, bent pyramid is three, two is the collapsed pyramid of yeah. Medum. Mm -hmm. Oh, number one, the pyramid of Dozier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So is that the step pyramid? Yeah, that's the step pyramid of Saqqara. So, so they're saying that's the first? Well, yeah, traditional Egypt Egyptologists think that the step pyramid of the Pharaoh Dozier, which was constructed by Emotep, is the progenitor of pyramids before that. There may have been pyramids before that that we don't have evidence of, you know, maybe that they they reused the blocks or, you know, Egyptians mm -hmm. took down the blocks to build new monuments. But they think that that the step pyramid of Saqqara or the pyramid of Djoser is the original and that Senefru, who may have been his son or his grandson, uh, came in and wanted to build a perfect pyramid. So you see how it has the steps? Mm -hmm. He wanted to fill in smaller blocks and they give it a point on the top. And some of them have a capstone, but I don't know that Senefru's pyramids ever did. Um, he wanted to come in and make it a perfect pyramid. So what they speculate with the bent pyramid, now I'll say again, Ben and Randall's evidence might be more compelling than what I'm about to say. Um, so what they think, what traditional Egyptology speculates is that the bent pyramid, you see how the lower side of it is more, it has yeah. more of a vertical incline. 
Well, they thought that maybe the way that they constructed the inner chambers uh, didn't that that the structure wasn't going to be sound enough if they were going to. I mean, because it's it's that's a can think about it when you're looking at the angle of how those the lower part of the pyramid goes up. How many more blocks and how much more how many more hundreds of tons of weight, thousands of tons of weight would go into that. And so they thought that maybe the inner chambers, well, traditional Egyptologists think that back then when Seneferu and his architects were building it, they thought, okay, so these inner chambers are not going to be sound enough. We need something, we've already built the chambers, this is how tall the pyramid's getting, we need something else to bolster the ceilings. So they speculate that Seneferu sends out an expedition to Lebanon and he gets cedar trees, cedars of Lebanon. If you've ever heard, if you ever heard of those before, some of the strongest trees in the world. And they, they transport these trees all the way from Lebanon, bring them down to Dashur, and, which I believe is where the Step Pyramid is, and then they bolster them into the ceiling. And so when, when people who study like archaeo architects or something like that, you know, architects who study ancient architecture, they believe that those trees were built into that pyramid. And so when that's carbon dated, it's carbon dated to about 2600 BC. And so that's like, that's a, that's a really tough argument to get around. And then when you look at the construction of the step pyramid, it's, it's very similar to the red pyramid and the red pyramid is, is like what the three great pyramids, it, what it looks like they're based off of. Now, I can go a little further than that. I didn't depict this last night. When you look at the Sphinx, the Sphinx is a super compelling argument in my mind for, for architecture that has been there for I mean, more than 10,000 years. Um, there's a really great book by Dr. Robert Schock. Have you ever heard of him? Mm-hmm. Um, his book is amazing. And I've had the pleasure of speaking to his wife a little bit. Um, his book is, is such a compelling case. And he feels that same way that the Sphinx is really compelling for a piece of architecture that's been around for more than 10,000 years rather than the pyramids. So what's interesting is, so the Sphinx, I believe, is largely carved out of, at least the outside of the outside of the Great Pyramids. It's the same type of stone. It's all limestone. And so when you look at the erosion on the Sphinx and you look at how much we know that the dynastic Egyptians were trying to repair the Sphinx, and eventually... Uh, eventually it was so old and unrepairable that I think around the reign of Akhenaten, which is, this is like 1400 BC. The Sphinx was built in about 2650 or 2560 BC. So about 1100 years later, uh, during the Middle Kingdom, I believe, getting mm-hmm. close to the New Kingdom, a pharaoh comes in and decides to bury the Sphinx. They, they completely they bury it purposely. They have like the dream stealer that's put in there between the paws. That dream stealer was carved a thousand years after uh, they think that the Sphinx, that traditional archaeologists think that the Sphinx was built. So anyways, they go in there, they bury the Sphinx. But this is the problem. <clears throat> Traditional archaeologists, Egyptologists, say that the Sphinx was built at exactly the same time as the Pyramid of Khafre, which Khafre is the center pyramid on the great. So on the on the uh, the, the great plateau. pyramids on the Giza plateau, you've got you've got Khufu's pyramid, Khafre's pyramid in the middle, and then Menkure. So Khufu is the father, Khafre is the son, and then Menkure may be the grandson or maybe the great grandson. And so the Pyramid of Khafre that's in the middle. Almost directly in front of that is the Sphinx, is the Sphinx in the Sphinx Temple. And so, but the problem with the Sphinx is when you look at the erosion inside that pit, it, it, does, it, doesn't, ma- it doesn't match up at all. Um, because what traditional Egyptologists say is that, so they built it in 2560 BC. And over the course of the next 1,000 to 1,100 years, those deep erosional markings that are inside the pit, they, that had to have happened within the course of 1,000 years. Because the, they, say this, they say that the Sphinx has been around for about, I think, 4,500 years. Mm-hmm. And all of that erosion, there are geologists who go there, and when they just show them, or geologists who have been there, they bring back photos and they show other professors and they say, what does this look like to you? And they're like... That's that's over ten thousand years of limestone erosion, and they're like, but that's no, this is in the pit of the Sphinx. So traditional Egyptologists are basically 
I don't think they have a way of explaining this, but they're not going to admit that it could be much older than dynastic Egypt. But what they're saying is that what they're essentially forcing everyone to have to believe is that within that 1,000 years before the Egyptians, while they're trying to repair it, and then before they bury the Sphinx, all of that erosion happened in that short little window. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But that erosion that we see there, we just don't see it on the pyramids. Like you, you don't, you don't see the weathering of those blocks in the same way that you see inside, that you see in uh, places like the Sphinx Temple. Uh, you, there's some evidence of it at the Valley Temple. Like in Egypt, th th I think there's all kinds of examples of something that could have been there for more than 10,000 years. But I don't think that the pyramids are the best example of that. But then at the same time, whoever built the pyramids, like the argument that, that, that they're making, which it, which I, I have to agree with, whoever built the pyramids was also capable of doing all these other things like building, uh, the, constructing the Serapium, the boxes, the, the diorite granite boxes that are in the Serapium, um, constructing the Osirian, the Osiris shaft. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe those are the correct names. Um, you know, it, it, it's just, just because we may know who built the pyramids, it doesn't answer how they built it at all whatsoever you know and i think a lot of egyptologists do that they go well the evidence really points towards that it was the old kingdom in egypt around 2600 bc so that's that but then they don't you know they can't admit that we have literally no idea how it was done and i think robert shock is the one who found out that there's water erosion on the sphinx yeah that it's actually not wind and sand it's made by water and it would make sense i don't know if that would make sense that there was no water erosion on the pyramids because didn't there used to be like huge casing stones like completely covering there, all there, sides of the pyramids yeah there there used to be but on the menkure pyramid there's those those casing stones are still there mm. um and they don't they don't bear that same kind of um, they don't bear that same kind of erosion. But then again, you could argue that that the pyramids on the plateau are higher up. Um, they're they're quite a bit higher up in elevation than right. than the Sphinx. But oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. There's an incline, I, I believe. Okay. Uh, I've never been there to see it for myself, so I'm kind of basing this off of really studying it on Google Earth and looking at some looking at some maps. But yeah, I think uh, like the plateau, it's raised up, you know? So, I mean, there's the argument that, uh, that, but then also, okay, so then you got to think about, so the pyramids would have been built in a time during the, um, it would have been built during a time when the Sahara was green. So mm -hmm. if the, so if the pyramids were built uh, 11,500 years ago, 12,500 years ago, um, then it would have been built in a time when the Sahara was green and experienced much more rainfall. So you would see like, you would see on the pyramids, you would see the devastating effects of erosion that you would see, that you see on the Sphinx. Like the Sphinx is, is completely destroyed by erosion and, and water erosion, but you don't see that on the pyramids, but maybe if they were still completely covered in the casing stones, but then again, at the top of the Khafre pyramid in the middle, those casing stones are still at the top. They mm -hmm, they right. never pulled those casing stones down. And I don't know that I've ever seen a complete study done on that, but I'd like to see, do those casing stones uh, show any weathering that would be like, you know, it, it wouldn't have been experiencing rainfall for 12,000 years, but maybe from, if it was made about 10,500 BC, mm -hmm. it probably would have been experiencing rainfall for another, uh, Africa starts to dry up around 6,000 BC, around the area it begins. So it would have been experiencing rainfall for like 4,000 years on a semi-regular basis. It's, it's probably possible <clears throat> that, I think people have speculated too, that the Sphinx is way older than the pyramids. I believe that. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and Robert Schock, I think he falls in that area, too. I think that he's a little dubious about the pyramids, which I am as well. And I think Graham Hancock is, too. I think, yeah, I think so. Um, what do you mean? I, I've heard him in some places say, I've heard him kind of concede that the pyramids might not be this, like, uh, Atlantean uh, civilization. Because there, there's, there's a lot of evidence that stacks up that, that the Egyptians may have done it. It does not what answer is the, the question of how they did it. What is the lot of evidence, though, that, that shows that they may have done it? If there's one thing I know about my listeners, it's that they appreciate innovation. 
That's why I want to introduce you to Ghostbed, makers of some of the most cutting-edge mattresses available. Whether it's their world-exclusive massage bed, the proprietary cooling technology, or the patented materials they use, Ghostbed is always finding ways to elevate the sleeping experience. And as a family-owned business with over two decades in the industry, they have garnered a devoted following. Ghostbed offers luxury mattresses without the luxury price tag, and they're known for their incredible sales. If you go to ghostbed.com forward slash Danny and use the code Danny at checkout, you can get an astonishing 40% off your purchase. You get a 101 night sleep trial along with free shipping and returns when you purchase your mattress so you can try it in the comfort of your own home. And Ghostbed has a dedicated team of sleep experts on standby to help you find the perfect bed. It's an unbeatable opportunity to enhance your sleep quality, so don't miss out. Visit ghostbed.com forward slash Danny today to transform your sleep for the better. It's linked below. Now back to the show. Um, that'd be a whole like, that'd be a whole different study for me to do that I haven't dived into uh-huh. because since he's kind of conceded that, I've already been studying the uh, right. America okay. stuff. But I want to clarify that I'm not like I don't have my ego wrapped in this argument. If it if it turned out to be uh, an Atlantean civilization structure that was around during the Younger Dryas, I think that'd be fascinating. Mm-hmm. But I find it just as fascinating that. Yeah, maybe, you know, for me, the most compelling thing is like, I can't get around the cedars of Lebanon that are in the Bent Pyramid. Uh, that's like, man, and it's, and it's, that's the same kind of architecture as the other ones. Like, how do we get around that? Maybe they were built in later, but here's the problem. If they were put into the Bent Pyramid, it was done to prevent the ceiling from collapsing. So we know that it was built in a way where it wasn't structurally sound. So if it was built in a way that it wasn't structurally sound 12,000 years ago, it would have collapsed by now. They, they, I don't know that it would have survived all that time for the Egyptians to then mm. go in there and be like, we got to put some like trees in here and, and you know bolster up this roof. And why would they have done it? I don't know. So can we find pictures? Do you, know, you think there's any pictures we can find on Google of the cedars inside the you, Bent Pyramid? You could try. That is a really, really tough thing to find. Now, there's an expedition that's going there next year. Is that it? Uh, expand it. Those those might be, but uh, I, I can't see it super clearly from here. Um, it doesn't look exactly like the photos that I've seen, but there may be more more than just one instance of them using these cedar of, cedars of Lebanon right. in the Bent Pyramid. Um so yeah, that's the red pyramid, I believe. Uh, that might be the inside of the red pyramid, but that might be the yeah, that's the inside of the red pyramid. Okay. If you keep going down, it looks like there's a ton of stuff here. There may I would be a love photo. to see somebody break down the cedars inside the bent pyramid, like the way I, I haven't like, seen anybody do it before. Really? I don't think so. No. I th- I wonder if Ben Ben's had to have done it if because if that's a, a big argument tor- uh, for the. Egyptians building those pyramids, I'm sure Ben would have kind of would have looked at it and made a video about well, it. Well, kind of like what we were talking about last night, I, I know he's been inside of the Bent Pyramid. Mm-hmm. I, I, I will say again that the Egyptologists mm-hmm. think that from studying the construction of it, now this would be something that next time Ben goes, I want to see him like dive into this because yeah. I'm not dogmatic in saying, it's just from my point of view, diving into it, I'm like, yeah, it's a pretty compelling argument that these were made by the dynastic Egyptians. But I'd love to see somebody prove me wrong. I want to be clear about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and Have I, you seen Ben's vases? The the, la- have, the latest yeah. analysis they've done on those vases? Yeah, he did. Where a, they, they compare all the different surfaces? Yeah, that's... Some of that stuff is is like inexplicable. I mean, it's just it's. I mean, there's no um, there's no explanation. And I want to say that again, like from my point of view, I'm an anthropologist with a love for ancient history. Okay, I, I love ancient Egypt and, and studying ancient Egypt as much as I love looking into these really mysterious sites that could have been built. You know, during this, I, I call it like an Atlantean civilization, but, yeah. but whatever kind of civilization, this Ice Age civilization, I love both of those ideas equally. And um, there's a lot of stuff that we know that the ancient Egyptians did that we still don't have explanations for. Um, and yeah, what I think is super interesting about, um, I think that some of those vases that he has are from, I want to say they're like, old uh, very early old kingdom or pre-dynastic and so Jozer, nobody argues that 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 saqqara step so this will be super interesting before we get into the america stuff yeah. I, I haven't seen anybody discuss this exactly this is a real dilemma i should say 
in ancient Egypt. So the pyramid of the pyramid of Djoser, it's the Saqqara Step Pyramid. Okay, it was constructed by Imhotep. He had at, in his necropolis there is art and hieroglyphs scattered throughout his necropolis that show him in the afterlife uh, visiting divine sanctuaries and performing miracles. I mean, there there are murals that I think now are in like Egyptian museums or maybe some European museums. You know, they take it out of there and move it across the world, but they found all kinds of examples of funerary uh, glyphs or hieroglyphs in his in his necropolis that show him. And then they say, and then they say, okay, so then after that, Senefru comes in, he's going to try to build a perfect pyramid. So he builds the pyramid of Maidum or Medum, and it collapses. It's known as the collapse pyramid. And then he goes on to the building the bent pyramid, and he makes it too angular. It's too tall. It's not going to survive in the middle, but he decides to finish it anyways. And he goes, you know what? This isn't perfect. Uh, I want to build one again. So then he builds the red pyramid. Okay, so then this dude built three pyramids over his lifetime and not in one place did he ever carve his name in any of those structures at all he never said like a, a guy who's a pharaoh who's like the most powerful person in the most powerful civilization that exists on the world at that time doesn't carve his name into his monuments into any of the three monuments that he builds and dedicated his lifetime to and then not only that his son khufu builds an even bigger pyramid an even better pyramid and then doesn't carve his name anywhere inside of it at all. There's no hieroglyphs inside of the pyramid. And then not only that, his son builds an even, I think I think that the center pyramid, the Khafre pyramid might be a little bit bigger than the great pyramid. And he builds an even more grand pyramid and then builds the Sphinx temple in front of it. And then they say he, he constructed the Sphinx as well. Nowhere is his name seen. Nowhere are, are any funerary texts, any hieroglyphs, anything that depicting this Pharaoh who used so much of Egypt's economy to build this pyramid and then not only that his son did it too so uh, you have you have six pyramids built over the course of multiple lifetimes where there's no hieroglyphs that and, and, and i mean I, pharaohs have to be vain people right i mean they're building this to be their tomb quote unquote and then they uh, don't allegedly. put their name anywhere that's a real dilemma in in egyptology that egyptologists can't explain um so how do they come to that conclusion then <clears throat> I think it's I think it's all through relative dating. This would be something okay. that I could dive into, but yeah. you know I, I specialize in, in ancient Americas. Yeah. But it, but it all it's all through relative dating. So I think that there's very loose documents. Like uh, here recently, within the last couple of years, um, there's this thing that makes headlines. That's like ancient papyrus found that proves how the pyramids were built. Did you see this? No. And, yeah, it's called the Diary of Marer. Okay. And it ends up being like a ledger. It's like a log book of an ancient architect who is leading an expedition down south of, of Lower Egypt. So in Egypt, Lower Egypt is actually the north side. Upper Egypt is the south side because of the way the river flows. The river mm. flows north. Okay. And so back then, you know, they didn't know north and south. Right. So they call it Upper and Lower Egypt. And um, I think I said that right. And um, so anyways, he it's, it's this guy named Marer who's... Uh, He's probably some kind of chieftain or something working for working under the pharaoh Khufu, and this is how this is how scant the evidence is in ancient Egypt. This is the kind of conclusions that they make, which it's not wrong to make conclusions based off of this, but it's wrong to be so dogmatic. Like like a lot of Egyptologists, the the guys who are who are at the top of the Ministry of Antiquities are are insanely aggressive about their conclusions, whereas like. My personal conclusion is I think that, yeah, I think I think the Egyptians did build the pyramids, but I'm not aggressive about it. If I would love for somebody to to like I would love to be sitting here with Ben and Randall and then they tell me something and I go, Damn, you're right. You know, and then and then I'll change my mind just like that. You know, I try to be like a pure scientist in that way. You know, mm -hmm. I, I just love the subject anyways. I try to stay, you know, I try to have a lot of humility in what I'm talking about. So anyways, they find the diary of Marer, and it's basically just a ledger or a logbook of he was bringing limestone, big limestone blocks back to a place called Khufu's Horizon. And so we know that Khufu existed. Like we know that Djoser, Senefru, Khufu, Khafre, Menkere, all these other pharaohs, we know that they existed because they're written about, they're talked about in other places. Um, but then, but then the Egyptological community comes out and goes, goes, oh, see, this is the, this is the diary of mirror. It proves how it was built. Well, no, it proves that 
there was somebody on an expedition to pick up limestone blocks to bring it back to Khufu's horizon. But we don't know what Khufu's horizon is. A lot of people think that's the Giza Plateau, that these were blocks that were being brought to the Giza Plateau during the construction of Khufu's pyramid. And, and I mean, and, and some Egyptologists will tell you like with 100% certainty, I have literally no idea what mm -hmm. what exactly that means. That we, it could be Khufu's palace. We assume he has a, he had a palace, you know, but that's never been found. Mm -hmm. And so there's just no way of actually knowing, but that's kind of how scant some of the evidence is. It's very loose. And we're also talking about like, remote antiquity you know during the time of, of during the time that these pyramids would have been built at the latest date say you know around 2600 bc that's still remote antiquity i mean like there's not much that survives there other than giant megalithic architecture that can stand the test of time you know now what is the similarities in the construction of the pyramids in egypt and the construction in the pyramids in mexico and south america um, are they super similar? <clears throat> like, do they? Do you think they were? There are pyramids that look like they were built around the same time. Well, there there were certainly pyramids built at exactly the same time. Uh, the pyramids in Corral. So I, I have a. I, I got I got some photos of this. You want me to pull this up? Yeah. Um, let me turn on my laptop. So, uh, okay. So this is the Valley of the Pyramids. Let's look at Corral. <clears throat> I might have to zoom in a little bit. Some of these photos aren't the best. Where is Corral again? Corral is uh, central Peru, kind of on the kind of on the coast. It's in an area called the Valley of the Pyramids. Okay. So there's all these pyramids that what I'm about to show you. There are all these pyramids that if I were to show you, like if I were to tell you this is an obscure site in Egypt, you you would instantly believe it. I'm telling you, bro, it looks exactly like really? Egypt. Yes, it's shocking. Um, let's see if we can get these up. So, but a lot of these photos, like. There aren't people that are going out there taking photos of these sites mm -hmm. um, with, you know, the same kind of uh, high resolution and, and great photo quality because people don't go visit these sites. You know, in, in Egypt, you could find a photo of, of damn near anything you want to find. As something as obscure as the Cedars of Lebanon in the Bent Pyramid, that's going to be tough because I don't think like your average person can get into the Bent Pyramid. Ben can Ben can get his way in there, but your average person can't. So I'd love to see Ben talk about it, because um, you know if there's a if there's a more compelling argument than what I'm putting up, I, you know I want to hear it and and I want to change my mind, you know, or I want my mind to be changed about it, because um, I think it's super mysterious, su that's super mysterious. But anyways, um, in ancient Peru, dude, yeah, I mean, um, okay, so let's say that. Egyptologists are right, and the old kingdom, pre-dynastic Egypt, are, are the progenitors of the Great Pyramid, or the progenitors of the pyramids in Egypt. Well, according to that chronology, about 600 years before that, between 3300 and 3100 BC, ancient Peruvians were starting to build pyramids as well. Not in the same way, though. And <clears throat> All right, so what do we got here? Okay, so these are, uh, these are the ancient pyramids of Corral. Now, the you can kind of tell that the like the top layer is missing because of how much it's been eroded over time and yeah. how much it's deteriorated over time. But most people have literally never seen this before. These date back to um, just uh, over 5,000 years ago, um, about 3300 BC to 3100 BC. They're, they're being created by ancient Peruvians and they have these all over this little valley. Let me see, I've got another photo right here. Uh, I'm sorry, this might not be a Corral pyramid. Here we go. There's two other pyramids of Corral. Now, the resolution on them is, is unfortunately not that great because, like I said, there's just not a lot of people going out here to take quality photos. This is something I intend to do over the course of my career, like publish a, a lot of studies as well as, just, as well as just good photos and videos and drone videos of these places. Now, I want to say there's around 15 to 20 of these pyramids that predate um, the official time of like the old kingdom in Egypt. And what's interesting about these sites is that when archaeologists go in there, the few that actually go there and, and spend time studying these areas, because this is arid. I mean, this is, this is a three hour drive into the middle of nowhere in Peru, in the middle of the desert. And what they're finding here is that these ancient Peruvians somehow were uh, well, I mean, they were obviously aware that earthquakes were a regular thing. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you see structures out here that are 
completely that they're about the same size as the as these pyramids but they're completely collapsed and so some of the stones are left over but a lot of the stones get reused and so there right here we see ancient peruvians working on building anti-seismic uh structures so anti-seismic would be um would be anti or earthquake proof structures and so they're doing this by like have you ever seen people build structures using like uh, concrete bags or, or bags that are full of rocks or something and they build it up and then they don't take the rocks out of the bag. They just use, it's like a, the bag is like an artificial brick that's full of rocks. That's kind of what they're doing here. This is like the beginning of, of Peruvians learning how to build anti-seismic structures. And so I guess what happens here, and I'm not, I'm not super, super familiar with, with the way Corral works. I'm much more familiar with, you know, these giant megalithic sites that, that we'll get into that they that are in Inca territory may have not been built by the Incas, but um, but this is kind of where traditional archaeology says that uh, ancient Andean culture, ancient South American Peruvian culture is learning to build anti seismic structures. So this is going on at exactly the same time that Jojer and Emotep were alive. Um, so yeah, this is kind of the beginning of which that. was about five thousand years ago. Yeah, so Jojer and Emotep, I don't think anybody disputes when they lived. The reason being, because at his necropolis, it says that was him. You know, he there are the hieroglyphs that are there. It's just, it's amazing that like the grander pharaohs that come after him, there's not like hard evidence that they actually existed. You know, it's just writings about them. But right. yes, yeah, this is, this is happening exactly at the same time and a little bit before uh, the construction of the Saqqara necropolis in Egypt, okay. basically exactly the same time. Okay. <clears throat> and the rocks that are underneath these things are they're are they just very soft stones? Yeah. Or so how do they how I, are they actually so, seismic? So I, they... yeah. So I think I think here they're not. Uh, maybe there's maybe there's like a strong foundation of some kind here. But really, that evidence comes later on uh, when you get to when you get to what they call. Uh, well, they call it like the Tiwanaku culture, Shavande Hantar culture, or the Shavin culture, and then the Incas, which the Incas, it's tough. So what, what you're talking about is, now I haven't gone to see these in person, but this right here, this may be uh, Alente Tumbo um, or Sakse Waman, um, similar architecture. But you know this, you see this uh, massive block down here to the bottom, to the right. bottom right. Yep. Uh, a normal person, so I'm I'm about five ten. I'm not even I'm not even half as tall as that block. Wow. And another maybe fifth of that block is is under the ground. <clears throat> but the but the foundations beneath these structures, it's like a it's like a soft foundation of of smaller rocks. So you would mm. think like like if you were have you ever heard of the temple of the temple of Jupiter at Baalbek, Lebanon? Yeah. Did they talk about that on on their no. shows? No, we didn't talk about that. So the temple of Jupiter has these. Yeah, I think it has the biggest artificial blocks on the entire planet. So um, the one's called like the stone of the pregnant woman, which is which mm -hmm. is like it, sitting in the quarry. But there's actually another one underneath it that's even bigger. So these are estimated to be uh, twelve to fourteen hundred tons. And they think that the Romans built it, but there's not very good evidence that the Romans built it. And if it wasn't the Romans, it wasn't anybody before them. So that's another compelling argument for a structure that's been there for you know, 10,000 years, potentially. I mean, this is just something that's completely inexplicable. And the civilization that they say built it, it's a hard argument to make that, that the Romans built the uh, built these stones at Baalbek. But anyways, so the stones of Baalbek, they're actually not the foundation. You would think that these massive stones are the foundation, but they're, but they're not. There is a giant solid foundation there. And the stones are put on top of the foundation. But when there's earthquakes, it cracks the whole thing because it's completely solid. Well, here, somehow these ancient American, ancient Andean cultures realized that having a solid foundation would crack and basically uh, destabilize the entire structure. So they build these massive, I'm, I'm talking about, these are some of the massive, some of the most massive stones that are used in the entire planet, uh, except in case for places like the Temple of Jupiter at Baalbek. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even, I'm not even sure that in Egypt you're seeing blocks that are this big. And these are made out of, uh, these are made out of granite, I believe. Um, wow. some, some of them are, some of them are basalt. 
but a lot of these are granite. So the these ancient Andean cultures are using exactly the same type of stone. I'm, I'm not sure that there's examples of diorite. There may be. Ben may know something more about that. Um, I'm not sure that there's examples of diorite, but they're using the same stones with the exact same hardness as what you're seeing in, in ancient Egypt. So they're building these on soft foundations. And uh, so I think, I think this is the same site from a different angle. Um, so, I mean, some of these are as, as some of these blocks are as big as a, uh, as, as a Volkswagen and, um, and then more of the block goes underneath the ground. And then right. beneath that is a soft foundation so that when there's an earthquake, that entire structure will shake and move and settle back into place. And in between these blocks, so let's, let's take you to, here's, here's a tower at Machu Picchu. Um, they, maybe this was an astronomical tower, but there's not really like a, um, so what's interesting is I believe that that's one window and you can see how it has the knobs on them. Uh, those yeah. knobs are seen all throughout the world and, and there, nobody quite knows why this. So the knobs are like another pretty compelling argument that a lot of people really dive into. These knobs are seen in Egypt. They're seen in uh, Baalbek. They're seen in ancient China. They're seen in Mexico. They're seen all over the planet on these giant uh, megalithic stones. And I wouldn't say that these are giant megalithic stones, but these are huge stones and these are made out of granite. And as you can see, there's no mortar in between them. Mm -hmm. They're perfectly fit to each other. So these were master stone masons. What were the knobs for? <clears throat> Do they speculate? Well, um, I, would think, I would think that a reasonable guess would be somehow to move these stones. But what's interesting is that they're not on every stone, but knobs that look exactly like that are seen all throughout the world. And there isn't really a there isn't really a, a definitive great explanation for what they were used. You would think that maybe they would have some kind of rope that they would tie around it to use as leverage to be able to move the stones more easily. Right. But uh, there's no there doesn't seem to be a systematic way in which the knobs are. Uh, carved out onto the blocks. It's it's almost it's very random, and uh, and I don't think that this is. It's obviously not natural. Um, so that's that's one of the that's one of the more compelling mysteries that r ties a lot of sites around the world together. And an interesting thing about these sites <clears throat> is that they have construction. Uh, well, these are some of the scoop marks that. Oh, we'll, that whoa, we'll get yeah, to. yeah. So you, so these are some. This is some evidence of of like scoop markings, almost where like the block is. It's like a, I've seen it described as like if you were to stack a bunch of uh, if you were to stack a bunch of cinnamon rolls in a microwave and heat them up and they swell up next to each other. Well, there are legitimate archaeologists uh, like Dr. Ed Barnhart, who's like a mentor of mine, who he thinks that these blocks may have been somehow melted into each other. And um, well, this is the geopolymer theory. Well, no, I don't think I don't think that he I don't think that he believes in in the geopolymer polymer theory. I think that that that's based in like that like, like they were liquid and poured into place. Right, like cast. Yeah, this yeah. Is a little bit different. This is a little bit different. So what he thinks, and I don't have, uh, I don't have any photos of what I'm about to mention, but there is evidence of of roads that are coming from these massive megalithic Peruvian sites, such as uh, Machu Picchu, Cusco. Um, Cusco, Peru. People think of it as a modern day city, but it was it was one of the it was one of the citadels, one of the capitals of the Inca world. So the Inca, whether they built these sites or not, knew that that was a place of importance. That's an ancient city, Cusco is. But the modern day city is built on top of it. Right. But every time there's an earthquake, the modern day city falls down, and the megalithic ancient city still sits there. It's been surviving this entire time. That's actually happened two other times in the 1650s. The Spanish. You know, they arrive in Cusco, they melt down all the gold. The Inca were master goldsmiths. So they had these giant gardens with life-size trees, life-size llamas, animals that, that were in there, all made out of all made out of gold. And and the Spanish uh, chroniclers that were there, they write down that it was some of the most majestic sites that they'd ever seen. Well, Spain's in a really tough place economically at the time. So the Spanish, they melt down all of the Inca gold. The insides of their temples are lined with gold plates. Um, and they have a, uh, they have like a, it's like a, it's like a golden, almost like a giant coin of some sort. And I believe it survived, uh, but it depicts their God, the fanged deity, which we'll get into because that leads to 
all of these ancient Peruvian civilizations that people are fascinated, that people, guys like Ben are fascinated by, Graham Hancock is fascinated by, all of this is connected to a civilization that's never been found that exists in the Amazon. But we'll, hopefully we'll get into that at some point. But anyways, um, so the Spanish, they try to cover up the city of Cusco. They, they take down all the gold, all the Inca gold that was there. They take it all down and they try to dismantle these, uh, like the, the city that's built out of granite that's there. Then they can't do it. So then about uh, in the 16, early 1600s, they just build their own city of Cusco on top. This, you know, the Spanish, they've killed off all of the native Peruvian people or enslaved them or whatever. Now they're all indentured people living around. So the Spaniards that are living there build their old, own city on top. Well, a massive earthquake comes in. And the, the ancient city of Cusco is built on a soft foundation that allows it to move and roll a little bit. And then it settles back into place. And there's not mortar that's going to crack and separate and allow the blocks to fall out because the blocks are placed perfectly together. So the entire Spanish city of Cusco falls and then the original megalithic city is underneath. Well, then they build it again. And then 300 years later in 1950, another, you know, like class nine earthquake comes in, knocks the whole city down, and then the ancient city is still standing there. So, it, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. So, um, no, this theory that Dr. Barnhart proposes is not a geopolymer theory. What they found is they found archaeological evidence of ancient roads that lead out of these sites like Machu Picchu, Cusco, Saxe Waman, Alente Tumbo. Um, and there are roads that go out of these sites and from places like uh, Chavin de Hantar. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -mm. So Chavin de Hantar is, we'll get into that. Um, and then uh, and then from Tiwanaku. Tiwanaku is a big mystery. Ben's got a video on Tiwanaku. Right. Um, it's, yeah, I believe uh, uh, Arthur Poznanski is the archaeologist who, uh, he was the first guy that proposed that Tiwanaku is of great antiquity, you know, up to 12, 5,000 years old. But they have found ancient roads that are leading out of these sites into the desert south of into the desert south of of these civilizations, into the deserts of Chile, um, and around the area of the Nazca lines. And so, in there, there are these acid deposits. And these acid deposits, scientists have proven that these acid deposits can melt and fuse granite. And that ties into um, what? yeah, that ties that ties into a lot of the local legends that the indigenous people have have said about the area that that their god like used acids to mold clay to build people. And so what they're finding, and this is like a frontier of archaeology. There's only so many people looking into this. And Peru is a, Peru and Chile. They're not very wealthy countries, and the very last thing that gets money is archaeology. So this is kind of. This is like a this is like the a, a outer edge of archaeology that's being studied right now, but there are like acid wells and acid mines that are in the deserts out there that have acid that's powerful enough that many archaeologists believe to fuse these granite blocks together, and that literally ties in to exactly what the local Tiwanaku people who still carry on their culture from these sites. That's like exactly the oral legends that they that they believe, and oral legends is like. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of dogmatic archaeologists, especially in the old world, in the new world, it's not like this. In the new world, people really value what the locals say because there's kernels of truth in there that are like vital. It's the heart of what people are looking for. And so, you know, like the story of Atlantis, that's based on that's based on an oral legend. Right. You know, that's that's based on what Plato told his students that Solon, you know, had passed down to him that Solon visits ancient Egypt and what, 600 BC, and they tell him that 9,000 years before this civilization was destroyed, that's 9,600 years, boom, that ends up lying, aligning with the younger Dryas. There's something there, you know, regardless of what, of what any scientists want to say, there's something there. And oral tradition, a lot of times ends up being correct. So oral tradition in this case, alludes to some kind of acid being used to build structures and they and there, there's some somewhere in there which we know this isn't true but that their gods use these acids to mold clay to build human beings as well um, which also ties in which is like similar to the christian story of how we were made from the dust of the earth and that kind of ties into like the white god Viracocha, who was in south america that whisked people out of the dust of the earth and everything it's it is really interesting that as you study this you start to see like wow that Veracosha, in some ways, 
kind of sounds like old world gods, you know? And so there's some loose connections there that I don't deeply study, but you pick up on a lot of these things and notice some really strange similarities. What do you think about that Veracosha god? I read a lot about that in Graham Hancock's book, but I, <clears throat> I don't I don't think I've ever heard of anyone talk about that outside of his book, the yeah, kind of fingerprints so, of the gods. <clears throat> so Veracosha is an interesting character that hasn't been fully figured out, but he's known as a lot of different things. Uh, Veracosha, the white god, the weeping god, the staff god. But my mentor and I, Dr. Barnhart, we refer to him as the fanged deity. Um, this is that's something that he kind of coined, and, and I'm you know tagged along with it. Um, and so the Fang deity, I, I think I've got some. Uh, I Doctor about, Barnhart came up with that. I think I think that's I think that's the term that he coins. God, for those it. scoot marks are insane. I'm trying to find the uh, aha. Here we go. So here's this is uh, an example of the Fang deity. I, I've got I have some other examples in there. So they say that this was Veracosha. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, it appears to be the same god. So this is like the, uh, this is kind of similar to like a sun disc that you would see in yeah. Egypt, but it's like a disc that depicts a fang deity. If you look close, he has he has fangs. Right. And so what's interesting is what's uh, kind of some revolutionary ideas that come from the ancient Americas is that, you know, people think that monotheism, the, the, the worship of one singular god mm -hmm. comes from ancient Egypt when Akhenaten declares himself the one true god, Aten. But that's, uh, you know, that's uh, 1400 BC. Well, way before that, the ancient South Americans were, were worshiping one God. And it was the staff God, Veracosha, the Fang deity. It, it, all that is the same person. Okay. Um, known as different things throughout different uh, civilizations. So, yeah, I think, I think for sure he existed. Is that all made out of gold? <clears throat> yeah, this is all made out of gold. So... <sighs> This is the gold. A lot of this is kind of the gold of El Dorado that the Spaniards were looking for. And I'm going to see, I think I have some other photos of this somewhere in here. Ah, here we go. I think, I think this is like a gauntlet that's worn around your arm. You can really see the Fang deity clear here. Oh, wow. Um, <clears throat> now, this is found at Chavin de Hontar, which is where, according to some of the archaeological evidence, this, I believe this is the early, the earliest, uh, this is around 1000 BC, maybe a little bit before that. This is the earliest evidence. I actually have it written on here of how old Chavin de Hontar is. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so 1200 BC to about 400 BC, we know that that is when these guys were populated. And now their culture, very likely from some, from some scant evidence of, of like, uh, some scant evidence of, of oral tradition, uh, biological material, and uh, like religious cultural material that they found kind of going in a little bit further into the Amazon. Um, they see like the remnants of a culture that's coming out of the Amazon and it ends up in Chavin de Hantar, which is uh, an ancient Peruvian site. And then they, and then these guys are worshiping this staff God, this, 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 it's, they call it like the staff God. Some people call it Veracosha. It's easier to call it the fang deity because they, it, every time he's depicted, he has fangs. And even in Tiwanaku, which Arthur Poznanski, um, which Arthur P Poznanski theorized was, you know, as old as 12,000 to 5,000 years, or I'm sorry, 12,000 to 15,000 years ago, there is a giant statue, like a monolithic statue that's standing there. And so if you look at some of these depictions of the Fang deity, in some, in some it's easier to see than others. Like uh, this, this guy right here, I think this is called the Ramundi stone. So you can see he's he's got fangs. He looks like some kind of, uh, I mean, he's a fang deity, but he's grasping what they think are stalks of corn. And so corn was vital to ancient South Americans and Central Americans. And what's interesting about that, um, corn or maize is what, they, is what it was known as mm -hmm. in Central America. Um, so that was the, that was vital for their life. It, it, was, it was immensely important. So every time you see a cultural religious statue that that's going to be an ancient Andean or ancient South American culture, it's almost always going to be a fanged God grabbing onto stalks of corn. And so that was their God that they worship. And there's all kinds of stories like uh, in ancient Peru, there, there's an oral legend that 
Varicosha came down and told the people of the area. Now, this is a, this is a legend that w- we don't really know the origins of it, but it, they say that Varicosha came down and he met some people that were on like the beaches of Peru, and he told them to flee to the highest mountains. And I think there's I think there's a name given for the mountain, but I can't think of it right now. And he tells him to flee to the highest mountain. He's going to flood the wicked world. And so there are people who they all flee to the highest. They all flee to the highest mountain, and this massive flood comes in and destroys all of the civilization around them. The people come back down, and uh, and Viracocha comes back out from the jungle and creates people out of the dust of the earth, almost exactly in the same way that you hear like God in, in the Garden of Eden. He, you know, he's walking in the garden, he's walking in the forest that's there, and he creates people out of the dust of the earth. Uh, and I should say that before that, there's a story that Varicosha appears from the forest and he's and he's weeping because he's been walking through the forest witnessing these these evil people and he's like a light skinned white man is is kind of what it's referred like to like Nordic looking I think so um, and um, and but they knew about they knew about these lighter skinned people before Spaniards ever arrived so it's it's it's, it's an interesting story but yeah he he comes out of the jungle and he's weeping from all the evil that's in the world. And he tells a group of like a small group of good people, kind of similar to Noah's Ark, flee to the top of the highest mountain. I'm going to flood all of this. So they flee to the top. They flee to the top of the highest mountain. They have all the provisions that they need there to survive, suppose, you know, supposedly. And then when the flooding subsides, they go back down and he comes out and creates new people and civilization emerges again. So there's a lot of really interesting, um, a lot of really interesting stories about Viracocha. The hard part about um, Ancient Central and South America, which is really my, really what I've been focusing on for a few years now, um, is that a lot of these, you know, when Spain showed up, they needed to establish complete dominance over the cultures that were here. And so they did that by destroying their oral religion, by destroying their or their oral oral traditions, mm-hmm. uh, their religions, their their legends, all of their writing. Like uh, we haven't gotten into Central America yet, but in Central America, um, we know that during the time of contact, there are records that the Aztecs were producing about 480,000 copies of paper. And so they were producing this paper before the Spanish ever arrived. In a year? Yeah. For, I'm sorry. 400, 480,000 copies of paper in one year. Wow. And they were writing on all of that. And they wrote densely. Um, <clears throat> and so... We know that that Mesoamerican, the Mesoamerican writing system goes back probably three to 4,000 years to uh, like proto-Olmec times. So we know that the Olmec were writing at least a little bit, but there's not a lot of um, research that's done. And uh, it's really hard to find these sites because they're so old. They're in the middle of the jungle. They get covered up really easily, like, like the soil deposition causes things to sink "Quote unquote into the soil mm-hmm. much more quickly, um, but we found evidence of of ancient writing that goes back three to four thousand years in Mesoamerica. So the Aztecs are like sitting on the shoulders of giants, right? I mean, they've got uh, they've got you know in fully fledged writing systems, and they're writing down their history. Well, what's really interesting is we know that the Maya were doing that more so. The Maya were more sophisticated, more educated. They had a they had a reign over Mesoamerica that lasted, you know, two to like 3,000 years. And so that... Well, give me the, the official timeline of the Maya. Okay. So, okay. So I'll tell you. This episode is brought to you by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex. Fellas, do you remember the days when you were always ready to go? Now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence boost in bed. Listen up. BlueChew.com. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, except it comes in a chewable tablet and it's only a fraction of the cost. The beautiful thing is you can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead and always be ready when that special opportunity arises. The process is super simple. Just sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And the best part is it's all done online. So no visits to doctor's offices, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made right here in the USA, and they're prepared and shipped directly to your door in a discreet package. Of course, first impressions are very important. 
but no one ever talks about the lasting impressions. Women say there's nothing sexier than confidence, and Blue Chew will give you the confidence where it counts. Try Blue Chew for free by using the promo code CONCRETE at checkout. It's K-O-N-C-R-E-T-E, and all you gotta pay is $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com using the promo code CONCRETE at checkout to get your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more important details and safety information, and we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring this episode. Back to the show. So, Proto Olmec, um, like when Olmec culture is starting to come to fruition, you're looking at like maybe the very, very beginnings is 2000 BC. So not that long after the great pyramids in Egypt are built, right? Are the, are the Olmec the first civilizations that we're aware of in South and Central America? Uh, not or in the not South America, but Central America. Central America. Yes. America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so they begin at about 1600 BC is when we start seeing some megalithic monuments, these giant heads that are like the size of this entire table to the uh, taller than the ceiling, you know, made out of basalt, made out of, yeah, made out of basalt, basalt, Mm -hmm. however you pronounce it. And, um, and so how do you pronounce it? Is it basalt? I've never heard anyone say basalt. I I say basalt. Yeah. Basalt sounds cooler. That's what, that's what I heard when I was there. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, so. They're made out of basalt, and that's when we see, <laughs> like, the pyramids of of Leventa and the, the necropolis of of Leventa, um, and that's when we see all of these sites being constructed. I'll pull up some old mix up real quick. Um, <clears throat> so here's a here's a one of the heads being excavated. Wow. So these heads weigh anywhere from about six to forty tons, and so Jesus. Um, I, yeah, I guess now now would be a good time. So like, let's go Olmec, Maya, Aztec, and so the Olmecs, these guys exist from about 1600 BC until about 300 BC. So they have a really long reign um, in their, you know, uh, of their reign in, in in Central America. And these guys, they seem to establish the idea of divine kingship um, all across Central America. So this idea that kings are gods, like they're they're the descendants of gods. The Maya then picked this up later. And so these guys are constructing. So here's one that's under the ground. So when this was discovered, I think this head was discovered in the 1800s and then it was officially excavated. Like this photo is probably the late 1920s. Um, and uh, so, you know, maybe just the top of the head was was uncovered, but Jesus. it's really tough to find these sites. And I think right now- And where is this exactly? This is in, I believe this right here is Veracruz, Mexico. Veracruz, Mexico. Yeah. So um, Veracruz, Mexico, just like the top of the heads are, are, was left uncovered, if, if even. I, I'm, I'm not sure the exact story. I'm not sure if it's exactly recorded as to how this farmer, his name was uh, Jose Maria that found this head. And I'm not sure if the story like is recorded as far as what he was doing to find it. Like in Gobekli Tepe, there, that was found by a farmer as well, who was out there. I think he's trying to like cultivate his land. Ding, ding. He hits these... Uh, I'm not sure what they're made out of, maybe limestone or something, but he hits these structures and then uncovers it. Farmers find stuff all the time, all over the world. Uh, here's another one. I think this may be the same head. So they've they've flattened out the area. They've they've excavated him. Um, and then that may be Jose Maria posed next to it, the guy who found it. Um, <clears throat> and then here's another head that was found. Um, so... Um, are they connected to anything? Are they connected to bodies? Are they just heads? No, it's just it's just a head, as far as as far as we know. And is it obviously they were moved by something? They were. They oh were... yeah. Oh, this is this is crazy. This is this literally the exact same mystery that we see in ancient Egypt. Okay, these guys establish themselves alongside the biggest rivers in their areas. So the reason that that dynastic Egypt is is so powerful is because they were able to cultivate a massive flowing river that was like a very powerful river and they were able to learn how to cultivate the land around them they were masters at cultivation and they built massive empires because of just because of the nile the nile was the source of their life these guys had the exact same thing they had two different rivers and they harnessed the production of maize which maize is like corn is everything to central and south americans uh, they harnessed they harnessed maize, and so they had all the wealth of Central America at the time that that they uh, reigned. Now, what's really interesting is these all of their wealth, all of their riches, everything that that they had was totally based on what gave you life. So they had access to the water, they had access to the food, they were able to farm. These basalt monuments, they're jade artifacts. So so in Central America. 
Um, these people weren't mining down far enough to mine gold out of the ground, but they could get jade. They could get like other precious stones. So jade was seen as gold to them. All of their precious artifacts that we find in their tombs do not come from Olmec heartland. They come from hundreds of miles away. Or in the case of in the case of the Olmec heads, the the basalt basalt comes from uh, up to about fifty miles away. The problem is it's not fifty miles away. Uh, along just like it's not along a river it's not a straight path it's through jungles mountains and rivers there is literally no evidence as to how they were able to move these and it's 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 almost exactly the same mystery as in the king's chamber of the great pyramid we see the rose granite stones that are in there the rose granite stones weigh anywhere from 20 to 80 tons. And in the ceiling, some of those columns are like 80 tons a piece. There's no explanation as to how they were moved from the Aswan quarries, which are 500 miles south in Aswan, Egypt, up to the up to the Giza plateau and then carried up into the pyramid. This is damn near the exact same mystery because they had to be they had they they were um, mined out of the we they found the quarries just like the same way they found the, the Aswan quarries in right. Egypt. But they were they were mined out of the volcanic belt of Veracruz, and so like uh, basalt is like volcanic rock, and so they mined out these giant boulders. Now, what's interesting is they believe that these were carved on the site that they were found. So they were carved when they arrived. So you may you may pull up like a like Laventa uh, Olmec altar. If you just look up Olmec altar, you'll see it mm -hmm. the, in, in here, you can see that there's chunks of this missing. And so there were these giant boulders and then they carved them out. So, I mean, you're looking at monuments that weigh anywhere from about 10 to north of 50 tons when they're moved. Okay. And they're being moved through the jungle. They're being moved through mountains, swamps, and rivers. And and archaeologists just yeah yeah so any one of these first ones so you can see that it has like a lip that comes over and so imagine all of the weight that was in the stone that's a really cool thing that we'll talk about in a second um <clears throat> there's catamundis in there there you go yeah okay so look at how how far the lip comes over imagine all the weight that that used to be on the stone before it was all removed to to un Whoa. you get what i'm saying so imagine how heavy that was. Now this, I just did a video on this. I want to say this is about 32 tons. So the original block I'm going to estimate is near about 40 tons. And dude, there's hundreds of these monuments, hundreds of them all over the Olmec heartland. And um, and how do we move them? <clears throat> oh man, it's it's an arduous process. Like they've they've tried to move. Uh, you need cranes to move forty tons. Do you need a crane to move forty yeah, tons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need you need a you need a crane to pick it up to put it on a truck that right. can lift it. But what's really interesting is they were moving like Toltec monuments in uh, in like northern central Mexico, up kind of near the the U.S. border. Mm -hmm. They were moving these monuments, and the trucks were breaking down because the trucks couldn't handle the trucks couldn't handle the weight. So this is similar. This is very similar. So what they say is. Um, what they say is that, oh, these were balsa river rafts. And so balsa is like a type of wood right. there. And they say, oh, these were balsa river rafts that that move these. But there's a huge problem with that. My mentor, Dr. Ed Barnhart, yeah. he goes to uh, he goes down to Mexico with a nautical engineer who's really interested in this. And this guy studies it. He studies the weight of them. And he creates like an, uh, it's like an algorithm spreadsheet type of thing where you can, you can insert a hypothetical size of your Olmec head. So on average, the smallest one is six tons. The largest one is 42 tons. Okay. But that's, but that's not including all the weight that was on there before the head was carved out of the stone. Right. Mm. And it was transported before it was carved because they found the remnants of like, where that, where they like, would like chip a block of, of the basalt off and it would fall on the ground. Those, those remnants are still there and they're able to like they can say, okay, this piece of the stone was put here, so we know that this head was carved right at this spot. Got it. That makes sense? Got it. And uh, <clears throat> do they have evidence of tools they used? No. 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 Yeah, this is another this is another mystery. Mm -hmm. Um but but basalt is is a much a much softer stone. Like if you and I had adequate chisels, we could chisel this stuff out. Mm -hmm. How do we move it though? That's mm -hmm. net. That has never been proven. So they say they say it was done on balsa rafts. So this nautical engineer that's traveling with Dr. Ed Barnhart, 
he creates this algorithm where you can insert your the hypothetical size and weight of your Olmec, of your hypothetical Olmec head, and then he was like, he was like, how big does the balsa raft have to be to actually transport it? And what he found is insane. I've never seen anybody talk about this before. So these um, these rivers that are in the Olmec heartland, some of them are, are like truly massive, wide, long rivers. What he found was that even if you made the raft 50 feet long and 50 feet wide in a, it, it's so big that it couldn't make it all the way down even the narrow parts of the river if you put a five ton olmec head on a raft that's bigger than the river itself it would sink the raft the smallest head is six tons this <laughs> is well there goes that so theory. so how do you so how do you move of uh, the 42 ton la cobata head so the, the biggest one you might you could look this up too uh the la and then Kobata Olmec head. And so what's interesting about him is he's the only Olmec head that has his eyes closed. Oh, click on the one where where it's a person standing next to it. There's a diagram uh, on there. Oh, there's a person. Standing. Yeah, yeah, so there, there's a person standing next to him. So um, some of the Olmec heads, I was taller than them when I walked up to him. I'm 5'10", mm -hmm. I was taller than the head. I could like barely see the top of the head. Th think about how tall this guy is. I mean, he's gotta be, um, nine, ten feet tall, and so there's no explanation. It's interesting. It's, you, don't see, you don't see the perfect symmetry that you see in Egypt. No, no, you you don't see that. Um, what you do see though is that the the quality of of jade polishing in their right. um, they make uh, I think they make obsidian mirrors in the Olmec heartland, and these are these were found in the 1970s. And, or maybe the 1980s, I think 1981, and they're not really published again after that. I haven't seen any modern photos. They're probably sitting in a cardboard box at the bottom of a museum somewhere. The mirrors that they made rival the reflection and polish quality and symmetry of any other mirrors that were being made in the world at the time. They were making them out of out of like obsidian, but it's like it it's like it was just never picked up again no they they found it they said wow that's really cool and there's only one photo i can find of it is a guy he's holding it in his hand he takes a photo of it and it's a reflection of himself but it's like the worst photo i've ever seen because it was taken in 1981 mm. um either at night or inside of a tomb or something huh. and uh so yeah but you don't see not in olmec architecture okay so stop right there go back yeah. so these are the column tombs now this is interesting i didn't know about this before i visited Laventa. And so I stood like right there next to that column tomb. I, I showed this in my most recent uh, video, Lost Knowledge of the Olmecs on YouTube. Um, so these columns are come from the same uh, basalt quarries that are in the volcanic belt of Veracruz. And these columns are used to create like a, it's like a caged tomb that they would bury their kings inside of. Mm -hmm. And these columns weigh half a ton to two tons a piece. Even these, if you tried to transport these, would sink any of the balsa river rafts that they proposed were used. Just one of these columns right here? No, 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 no. But if you tried, like, like I'm thinking, I don't know what, maybe half of those they mm. put on one boat, you know? I mean, I, you put half of those on one boat and then you sink the boat. You know what I mean? How could these things have been transported? There isn't an explanation. And it's not like the, it's not like the uh, Mexican you know, Institute of Archaeology tries to hide this. They just don't have an explanation for it at all. And in some ways, there's kind of the same attitude of like, um, well, we don't really know how to explain it, so we're just not really going to address it at all. You know, a lot of the same mysteries that are in Egypt that aren't addressed, it's kind of the same thing here. You know, mm. Pe uh, there are a lot of archaeologists that repeat the explanation of how these were moved on uh, balsa rafts, and they all quietly know it's Did wrong. Did they have the wheel back then? <clears throat> they did have they did have the wheel. So what's really interesting is so there's a there's a misconception that ancient Americans did not have knowledge of the wheel. Like they say that well, ancient Americans they they didn't have the knowledge of the wheel, um, but they also weren't able to you know they didn't have the knowledge of the wheel, but they also weren't able to move megalithic giant monuments with the help of beast of burden. So beast of burden is going to be like a horse or an ox, something that you would strap, you know, something heavy to and have that quote unquote beast move the object for you. Well, they didn't have horses before the Spanish arrived. They didn't have ox before the Spanish arrived. They didn't have these, these, you know, animals that they could <laughs> kind of enslave to do their work for mm -hmm. them. 
Now, and then they say, and then they say, well, then look at the monuments that they built. How did they do all this without the wheel, without knowing about the wheel, without these beasts of burden? Well, what adds to the mystery is that they did know about the wheel. There are children's toys in Central and South America that have that are made out of like a little llama or a jaguar, and you can roll it back and forth. So, so like the child's toy of an animal that's on rollers on wheels was created in Central and South America. That does not come from the old world. Like, like we would think that that would be like a Western type of thing. No, that comes from ancient Amer like ancient Central and South American children's toys were used as wheels. So they knew that you could make something to roll. The problem is, where are you going to roll it here? It's it's swamp. Like, where are you going to roll things here? You have dense swamps. There's not even... It, like, like if we had a car and we dropped a car right in there, you could drive the car about five feet. You know, it, it, before, before Westerners came in and uh, chopped everything down and built roads, you right. might be able to drive a car five feet and then you have to stop. There's no... Uh, there's no reason to have a wheel in this world. But then that's the big thing. Those those giant boulders that I showed that are in that are in Peru, dude, some of those are on top of the mountain at Machu Picchu. And that is like a straight vertical ascend. I, I, I'm trying to think of the um, the original explorer who quote unquote discovered the site. He's like the first guy that officially documented it. He was ascending up on foot and he fell down and rolled like 20 feet because it's so hard just to go up on foot. But you have blocks there that are taller than the ceiling, 12 feet wide, three feet thick, made out of solid granite that sit up on top of this. I mean, it's just, uh, dude, I mean, in some ways when I talk about stuff like this, I'm like, no wonder people thought, people think aliens did this. Now, I don't think aliens did it. I think it's all human ingenuity with maybe, maybe there's some kind of a, uh, truth to humans being aligned to some kind of uh, higher power of some sort that seems to be that seems to be a religious trend in central and south america so so in the amazon you know the, uh, there are people all the time who go down there and, and they take ayahuasca and they have experiences and encounters with um, angelic beings that other people have other people say that they've encountered as well um, now this is getting in like real fringe stuff, but you know, I, sometimes, sometimes I think about like our very existence and how enigmatic it is. And I think like it would make more sense if there were beings that were higher than us. I don't mean aliens, but I, I don't know. I mean, maybe something spiritual, but you know, look at what ancient cultures did in the name of their gods all throughout world history. They were all into psychedelics. They were all into plants that could put you in a, uh, I don't know if you call it a higher state of consciousness, but a different state of consciousness. And they all, uh, they all, you know, have accounts of of interacting with these beings. And, and sometimes I wonder, you know, did uh, did these ancient people? I mean, clearly they were they were aware of something that we weren't aware of. Uh, one example I saw just this morning. <clears throat> uh, have you ever seen these videos of tribes when people explore in the Amazon? <clears throat> sometimes there are videos, e even today, it's becoming more popular. Um, there are people, there are people who will go down into Western Peru, like probably near where Paul Rosalie is. And they'll go, uh, out into the jungle and they'll get real close to these tribes and they'll have these cameras that like with these long lenses mm -hmm. and they're watching people. And sometimes the tribes, people will see them and they'll, they'll just, they'll just sprint off into the jungle and disappear. Well, <clears throat> Th the same thing is happening in Papua New Guinea. Have you ever heard of you ever heard of that island? Yeah, it's a it's a little island like in Indonesia that area, mm -hmm. and um, there are tribes out there. And when they sing as a group, and when that it's it's like it's like the 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 hymns that they have are connected to something that's different than than like like we're so. Uh, we're, it's like our our spirits in in modern day in the modern world are so dead. It's they're connected to something beyond, like something natural is what I'm trying to say. They're connected to something natural, and when they sing, you can feel it in your soul that what they're connected to is something natural. It's like it's like the jungle and the nature and the world is singing through them, you know. And I, I we could look this up, like like. Has a, anyone ever recorded these? Yeah, I mean, I saw a video of it on TikTok this morning, and you really? hear you hear the song, and you're like, in all the comments, all the people are like, "This is something different." Everybody who listens to this recognizes this. Now, this is getting into like a little bit of woo, woo stuff that I don't actually really talk about unless it's a conversation like this, because I can't prove it, you know, and I want to be like a respectable educator. But you know, I mean, yeah, I I really do think that there's a, there's a very spiritual aspect 
Where can we find it if you wanted to look for it? <clears throat> uh, man, if you just look Besides, up... Uh, only on TikTok? Yeah, maybe on YouTube. If you looked up like Papua New Guinea indigenous person singing, I don't know. Or Papua New Guinea native person singing. And are they? can mm. they get up close to these people or do they... Oh, yeah, yeah. They're nice people. Oh, they're... they're yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, click on that first one. Here we go. When they walk back, they sing through the forest. Whoa. That's amazing, isn't it? They're making all those background noises too. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the guy on top he kinda adds on to it a bit, but when they walk back they sing through the forest. But imagine an entire tribe singing that. Yeah, with that. So the the context behind that first one that we uh, the context behind the first one that we listened to is what he what the guy on top is doing his microphone is he's mimicking when an entire tribe of those guys get get together Mm. they still produce music that sounds like that there's a guy who's the low there's a guy who's the high there's a guy who's doing hymns in the background and when you look at that indigenous Papua New Guinea guy um, you know he's probably not aware of a lot of the quote unquote scientific advanced things that you know westerners know about right. but you, that guy's tapped into something on our planet mm. that's natural and that was meant to be here and that wasn't polluted by our western uh like selfish vain progressed society that uh also destroyed rome you know what i mean mm. like there's something very natural out there and so when i study ancient civilizations i see i see some evidence of of uh I mean, certainly there's evidence of psychedelics, but certainly evidence of, of people that were tapped into something that was beyond us. Like um, one evidence that you, one thing you could look up is look up where jaguar. It's like a werewolf, but just jaguar instead of wolf. It's in the and then put Olmec. So this idea of a were jaguar, and this is something that I haven't seen Dr. Barnhart talk about, but this is a this is kind of getting to my own theory. Mm-hmm. Is <clears throat> there are stories of people who do ayahuasca and and other like strong hallucinogens in the jungles of Central and South America. And they see jaguars like during their, um, during their trans and, and, uh, and then some people even turn into like a jaguar. They're like seeing through the eyes of a jaguar or like possessing a jaguar becoming that. And so, you know, some of the, some of the ancient Central and South Americans believed that, when they were seeing a jaguar, they may have been seeing a god, seeing their ancestor, seeing a um, like a wizard, somebody who is um, who is po- who is possessing like the spirit of a jaguar. So they start, um, yeah, do the jade mask that's uh, one from the right. Yeah, that one. That's just a really good depiction. So they have. I'm talking about hundreds of these, dude. Um, and so they really believed that their shamans were becoming jaguars that they were connecting with the nature world around them now what's what do you see that's similar to this that you see in the fang deity it's almost the same thing i mean it's the fang deity is is very likely a jaguar god that ruled over south america and the evidence shows like uh, relative dating cultural evidence biological evidence shows that somewhere in the amazon at some point i mean this could be this could be 8,000 years ago. This could be th- even 30,000 years ago because they're finding, they're finding caves in the Amazon that were inhabited 30,000 years ago, way before people thought that, that people were supposed to be in the Amazon. And so the Amazon is very likely the fertile, in my opinion, the fertile crescent of high culture throughout Central America or throughout South America. And then it carries up to uh, Central America as well. Where have they found these caves exactly? <clears throat> uh, the southeastern side of the Amazon. So, you know, a lot of the archaeological work 
um, that's done are on sites that are kind of on the edges of the Amazon. People don't go directly to the center and start, right. you know, doing excavations. So they kind of start on the outside and go in, but you know, they may never make it to the center of the Amazon. It's it's uh, it's like two million square miles or something crazy. Yeah, right? I mean, it's almost impossible to to traverse. But there's one archaeologist. His name escapes me right now. <clears throat> but he has been down in the Amazon his entire life and has found multiple cities. And these are cities that are made out of uh, that are made out of earthen mounds. So like, uh, and he he's in the same area. He's on the western edge of the Amazon, um, exactly where where Paul is at. And the the thing about it is, you're not going to go out into the Amazon and find stone structures in that part of the Amazon because it's all clay on the ground. So what they would do is they'd have these buckets and they'd build like earthen mounds and pyramids um, in the Amazon, and they would build these canals to each other and they build these raised streets so that you know it rains so much so you can walk on a road without it being flooded they also built their houses on top of mounds and they built their gardens and farms on top of mounds and then when it would rain the little canals and aqueducts that they would build they had these little boats and they would sail to other cities in the center of the amazon through artificial rivers that they had created and these cities are being found all over the place i'll, I'll show you i have a couple photos here now what evan what have, have they carbon dated things inside these caves to say that there was yes. uh, there was people there 30,000 years ago? Yes. Yeah, so so in this cave um in the cave that I'm talking about, uh, you could look up like 30,000 year old cave found mm. in southeastern Brazil. So here's one example of these cities. So what they found is like like on on the surface, there's not a lot to see, but all throughout this entire area, they're finding evidence of homesteads. But a lot of these homesteads were just built out of wood, right? I mean, they were like a, they were wood thatch roofed homes, but giant settlements full of millions of people. And so you can see these, uh, you can see these depressions. What's thought is that these were kind of like moats and so they held water and it allowed the water to slowly mm. seep over onto the center area to um, like feed their crops. The Egyptians did the, they did exactly this, this exact same thing. And then they would also have these little boats that they would sail to. So they have these giant straight lines that go all the way across the jungle and like the lowlands on the outside of the jungle where there's, where there's not trees and they could sail to other cities just on these little rafts in the middle of the, in the middle of the jungle. Now, what's thought is that these may just be satellite towns that are on the outside of the Amazon rainforest and that somewhere deeper in there, very likely, I mean, LIDAR is already showing that, that, that these exist. You're, we're very likely gonna see bigger earthen structures, like massive giant pyramids and stone structures as you get away from the Western Amazon where it's all clay, you get closer to the center and, and closer to the Eastern side, you're gonna find more uh, like stone in the ground. And so they've already done LIDAR scans that show uh, in the Mato Grosso region of like Southeastern Brazil, exactly where Percy Fawcett. So in, uh, in his expeditions in the Amazon, his first expedition, he was trying just to map the uh, river, I think to establish a border around like Brazil and Bolivia. I think that was his first thing. And then when he was there, he had grown a distaste for the uh, arist aristocrats that were in England who looked down on native, uh, on native people in the Americas. And he grew to love the native people because he saw something in them, kind of like what we're talking about, that guy in Papua New Guinea. These people are connected to something else. There's something else uh, you know, he, he was a, like one of the first guys that realized that the way that they cultivated, the way that they built their cities, the way that they cultivated their crops was all mathematical in nature, that they knew about math, that they knew some things about special things about science and geometry, about tracking the sun. They, they had, uh, they had like, uh, calendars as well, which, which are not, not calendars, but they had, uh, clocks that they would build into the ground where no matter like depending on where the shadow was they could mm -hmm. tell what time of year it was and when the next seasons were coming and he he was a guy who maybe not was the first person to actually discover these things but he popularized them and so <clears throat> he's at his horse dies uh he he's his horse dies and then they like eat his horse or whatever and at this place called dead horse camp and he writes a letter back to his wife that says uh he was like he was like, in the area that I'm going down now in the, in the uh, Mato Grosso region or whatever, he's like, very likely I'm going to find the entrance to Zed, which is this lost city that he's looking for, uh, which aligns to some of the oral traditions around there that like there were people all throughout South America. There were probably multiple of these massive cities um, full of lots of gold and wealth because, you know, he's hearing about this, uh, man, I... 
I may be I may be mispronouncing this or getting the name entire, entirely wrong, but there was a city called like Ziputli, something like that, and he just called it Z. And then there's also the story of El Dorado, which is on the northwest side. So he's on the southeast side. So there's multiple stories of these cities that sometimes get jumbled together. Like people think he was looking for El Dorado, but he wasn't. He was looking for a different city with its own legend. So he descends down into the Mato Grosso region of Brazil, goes missing. Nobody ever sees him again. 97 years later, they run big LIDAR scans over that area and they find a city exactly in the area that he went missing. And it's complete with a step pyramid. It's complete with its own temples, its own city grid layout that they speculate may be aligned to certain constellations that are in the sky, which would have meant that they cleared out the land that they lived in. Like they chopped down all the trees so that they could study the stars. And they found uh, aqueducts and highway systems that lead deeper into the central part of the jungle. But, you know, you need the money to fly these planes. Like, it's not as easy as, like, you buy a drone that has a LiDAR camera on it because those are crap. Like, you need, you need a LiDAR camera on a plane that costs, like, $50,000 to take it out for one mission. And I just don't think that there's the money there. So that was... <sighs> just over a year and a half ago that they found uh, that step pyramid and nobody has walked there today. Nobody has walked out there. They haven't sent more LIDAR drones out there, but they know there's a massive highway that's going straight off into the jungle, definitely to another city, but it's so dense and it's so remote and it's so far out there that nobody is crazy enough to do it for free. You know what I mean? Because the Brazilian government, they've got their own things going on. They're not really worried. Like, what are they going to do? A big part of if these places are even going to be explored and excavated is can they make a tourist site out of it? You know, can they bring people in to come look at it in the middle of the Amazon? Hell no. You know, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. You'd have to to build a massive road straight through the Amazon to bring tourists there. You know, people who are advocates for the Amazon literally do not want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. Um, so it's, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, that's a frontier of archeology, span but very likely the origins of South and Central American religion and culture come from somewhere deep inside of the Amazon. That's in in a, a city civilization that's never been found. Is there anyone out there that speculates that some of these stone structures or any of these things that they found have been, they were made before the younger Dryas? (laughs) Oh yeah, yeah. So when you're looking at okay, let's go to uh, I'll look at uh, let's go to some uh, let's go to megalithic South America. Okay, <laughs> so this is an artist depiction of what the site of Tiwanaku may have looked like. So Tiwanaku is an Andean culture um, that lived in Bolivia. Now we know that the Tiwanaku people of about 180 to 1080 lived at this site, but there isn't a lot of evidence that they are the ones who constructed it. Now, these are some of the, uh, these are made out of, out of andesite, um, which I don't think andesite is quite as hard as granite, um, but it's, but it's close. I mean, these Mm -hmm. are very, very uh, giant blocks and look at, look at the, look at how big the, um, I'll look up here, look at how big the stair steps are in that center temple, that gateway, that top look at that doorway. Man. Yeah, yeah. Look at the look at the the blocks that are on top. Those are kind of reminiscent in my mind of of the roof of the king's chamber. Getting something like that up there, I mean, you're talking about like we would need a crane to do that today. Are those are those so those walls and the ceiling around that doorway, are those separate pieces? Um or are those one solid so, piece? No, no. So so you can it'd be easier to see it on my computer, mm-hmm. but um, so the walls are, the walls are like multiple columns and the ceiling is multiple columns. So they're like rectangular columns that are all stacked together. Okay. Got it. Um, <clears throat> and then also here at Tiwanaku, you have some of these H blocks. So this mm. is some of the really bizarrely intricate, uh, monuments that there's no explanation. Like were these for walls? Were they foundations? Nobody knows. They're, they're so scattered. Look at that. I mean, how, how as a stonemason does somebody do that? And, and I, I go on like, a, I'll read in all kinds of forums where architects, oh, and do you see on the top of that, do you see like the little groove that looks like it's kind of like a notch that goes inside? Yes. So what they speculate was that they were melting, this civilization that did it was so wealthy that it was melting gold and silver together to act as like, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, but they, they were 
hinges maybe it would be the would be the right, right. word to, to hold, hold the blocks the together. together yeah so they were melting silver and gold in those little grooves to That's keep the nuts. to keep the blocks together and then what are these what are these geometric designs for literally nobody knows and when you get down inside the stone so like not on the outside but when you get down inside the stone all of this all of these things are perfectly symmetrical how do you how does somebody do that these are eerily similar to a lot of the things that we see in Egypt as like the Serapium boxes the the how well those are carved this is mm. eerily similar to that and reminds me of it and you look at how so here's another example but look at how scattered this is what <laughs> what was all of this you know are these parts of buildings are these uh foundations are they walls they certainly don't look like it what is the purpose of all this oh you see the you see those two h blocks you see the foundation that they're sitting on yes <clears throat> that entire foundation i haven't been to this site to look at it but and 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 uh, i hope to go next year but that entire foundation weighs about 165 tons and it doesn't come from that area. It's not like bedrock. It was transported from somewhere else. Mm. So this, so Tiwanaku is a truly bizarre site. Uh, I could, got another example here somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those... Tiwanaku Pumapunku. This is the this is the gate of the sun. <laughs> but look at um, somewhere on here. I think I've got it. Oh, here's the uh, this is the staff god, the giant. So he's got. They're, they're heavily eroded, but he's got fangs and he's holding stalks of corn. Um, but this is the staff god as well. Um, so this guy, this god likely goes back thousands and thousands of years, whoever this is. I have a better photo of this somewhere. What, what were you about to ask? No, I was just going to say, like, it's so <clears throat> frustrating that there's not more effort and more money put into understanding this stuff. It, dude, it, it yeah, man, it, you're you're a hundred percent right. It's um, it's like we like you could you could redefine everything. Yeah, you you could you know it would question everything, you know, even down to like the existence of mankind when you look mm -hmm. at this stuff. But it, it, the lens our society looks through stuff is is commercialism, consumerism war money and this is just we're too far down the road already yeah. to like rewind and actually say like what could we actually discover if we put millions and billions of dollars into really understanding what this is okay yeah so you want to get into talking about discovering something so dude there is so much left to be discovered now first like, off like one of, sorry to interrupt but like yeah, yeah, one, one okay. of the things that really really blew my mind about those serapium mm -hmm. boxes in the in those pyramids is that this guy named Chris, you know Chris Dunn? He yep. he um, wrote about in his first book. He he looked at those Serapian boxes and how perfectly symmetrical they were cut out and polished. And he asked like the biggest granite company, the biggest granite production company in the United States, what it would take to recreate that. Mm -hmm. And he he said it would be over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And he said after they even got the permits and paid like he said it was going to be like fifty thousand dollars just to haul that stuff out of wherever they quarried it from, he said they would never in a million years cut it out of one piece. They would cut all the walls out separately and bolt them together. But those boxes are all carved out of one solid stone. Yeah. yeah. That's, Just the amount of resources it would take for us to do today is un, unfathomable. That You saying that, there's something exactly like that in the Maya world. Will you look up the sarcophagus of Pakal? Pakal is spelled P-A-K-L. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, so the sarcophagus of Pakal, it was found in the Temple of Inscriptions in Palenque. It's a Maya city. I was just there in January. Um, and so, oh, dude, I'm so glad you said that. We have a whole other rabbit hole to go down. Okay, so Palenque. Um, you can pull up that first. Um, <clears throat> so this is a... Uh, this is a cast of it. This isn't the actual thing um, because it's still, it's still inside the... Uh, it's still inside the tomb today, but I stood here. This is like a, a life-size replica shit. cast, dude. I'm telling you, this thing right here, it's seven feet tall, ten feet wide, fifteen feet across, carved out of one solid piece of limestone. Okay, and it has hieroglyphs all the way around the side of it that tell the story of the Maya gods of of Palenque. So, so uh, this this exists. Um, 
in Palenque, which is Chiapas, Mexico. Now, the city itself existed from about 1000 BC to 700 AD, and there's like a mysterious collapse of, of Maya civilization. And that 1000 BC estimate, it could go way further. There's there's evidence off in the jungle that that there's it goes back further. Um, <clears throat> so this is really in, this is really interesting because on the inside of that, it's not a completely hollow box where Pakal's body sits inside of that sarcophagus was was carved out perfectly to be the size of his body. That entire sarcophagus is solid. So imagine they find one of those Serapium boxes. Mm -hmm. That's an actual, I mean, what do they say? They're like cow sarcophagus or something like that? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, they well found, I think they found cow remnants in there. Yeah, something along those lines. But um, so, so they're like carved out on the inside. This thing is a solid block where like the lid is, the lid is cut off. Like it, how they cut the lid off of the top of that. And then they carve out a crevice on the inside. That's perfectly the size of Pakal's body. And it's like outlined to be the size of his body. And so they place it. It's so heavy that they place it on the foundation of the pyramid and build the pyramid um, around it. So it's, it, this is like, this is one example, but what's interesting is is this moving these megaliths in the Maya world. One of the reasons that that the Maya world doesn't get as much love as you know places in in uh, South America, like like ancient Peruvian sites like Machu Picchu, and then of course Egypt. Uh, you know you have all these megaliths, which are you know blocks that are the size of this table that we don't know how they moved it. What's really interesting is, I mean, dude, you're not going to find this published anywhere. This is private conversations between archaeologists that work in Central America and only things that they know about. There's not like a popular mouthpiece that's voicing all this stuff for the, for the world to know about. So this kind of, these kind, you know, I, I would consider that a, a monument, okay? That giant of a monument was not common in the Maya world around the time that Pakal was alive. So that's about 600 AD. It wasn't common. They They weren't they weren't doing that at all. This is a one of a kind thing. What's really interesting is deeper into the jungles in the most remote areas, places that there's no photos taken of these sites. These are things that, that I want to visit over, over the next coming years. The further you go deeper into the jungle, the older the sites get that they, they can date that by pottery. Like they, they can see how, how uh, Central American, Mesoamerican pottery evolves over time. So when you find pottery in certain places, you can go, oh, it's this type of pottery comes from this area. They know that because they found that kind of pottery in, in graves, right? Mm -hmm. The deeper you go into the jungle, the older the sites get and the bigger the blocks get. Just like ancient Egypt, the older it gets, the bigger the blocks get. Just like in, uh, seems to be just like in South America, the older the sites, the bigger the blocks get. So deep into the jungle, there are places that there aren't photos taken of these sites. Uh, I, I just did an interview on my, for my YouTube channel. This hasn't come out yet. Maybe it'll be out by the time this episode comes out where I asked Dr. Barnhart, and I kind of knew this a little bit, but I asked him, you know, one, one reason Maya architecture doesn't get the love that it deserves is because there's no megaliths. Uh, do you know of any examples of it? And he goes, he goes, the short answer is yes. The long answer is they're at the oldest sites that are in the most remote places deeper into the jungle. And he was like, so if you're out in the jungle and you discover a Maya, so that, yeah, that's the inside of the, uh, that's the inside of his um, tomb. So that entire tomb um, would have been covered in like, in like beautiful, uh, red cinnabar, uh, like blue Maya paint, which they don't know how they created the paint yet. Um, that, that whole thing is like one complete solid monument. But that wasn't normal. That was a replication of older Maya architecture, largely that, that isn't photographed. Like at some places in Pakal, when they dig down underneath the, or in Palenque, when they dig down underneath the, the city, they do see, um, I, I haven't seen this placed on any official um, studies, but I've seen people just go in with their cameras and underneath the structures, there are giant stones. And so these Maya cities, much like Cholula, have you heard of the yeah. pyramids of Cholula? Oh, yeah. Cholula, we know was populated. I think it's like, I think Cholula is the most consistently populated city on the entire planet. Like it's been from the time that it was built, it's just been populated the whole time. No matter how far back they dig it, people have always been living there. A lot of Maya cities are the same way. There's a pyramid, the next the next 
emperor or king builds on top of that, builds on top of that, builds mm-hmm. on top of that. So the more you go to the center, what's weird is that those blocks are are bigger and bigger and bigger that you get to the center, but they're older as well because it's not the same. It's not like one king built the foundation and then built everything out and the blocks got smaller. It's the first king used the most massive blocks and everything else that came after it was much more inferior. So way out in the middle of the jungle, just to show you an example here, I'm, I'll show you guys a, a photo. <clears throat> this is how little that we know about the, the uh, like uh, some people call it like the, like the jungle of stone. That's like what the Maya jungles are, are called. Mm. About 25 years ago, the city of Palenque, which is what we're seeing in aerial view right now, this is like the most grand city of the Maya world. About 350, um, about 350 structures were actually mapped and identified and put on display. And all of those that you're seeing are in this photo right now. Some of them are kind of com- com- covered up by treetops and the way that they break down the structures may not be super conventional. Now, Dr. Ed Barnhart was hired to go through this area and map the entire area, I think from 99 to 2002. And so what he found was that what was on display was like less than 10% of the entire city. The actual entire city is this entire square of jungle that that most people had never seen before when he walked out there. So what's on display when you go there today is this. The entire city is all of this right here. And those 300 structures that were on display, to give you an idea of how packed Maya civilization is, those 300 and some odd structures that are on display, um, that's that's what they'd known about. By the, three years later, by the time he was done mapping it, it had gone from 350 to 1,150 structures that are in that tiny little area. So, <clears throat> and there were structures. So this main palace right here, yeah, this is the uh, this is the royal palace. This right here is the temple of inscriptions where that megalithic. Uh, uh, tomb sarcophagus was found um there was there is another structure out there that i'm going to go to probably next year when i do my expedition expedition to yashilan which hopefully we touch on um i'm going to go back out there because there's another structure out there that's bigger than the palace that's sitting in the jungle but and I he think saw this he mapped all of it yeah he mapped it all he mapped the entire thing and when i say mapped i don't just mean like oh this is here this is here he mapped every angle, every staircase, the height of the, every pyramid sitting on top of a staircase. He mapped the foundations. He mapped how far, like I'm talking, I have a, I have a picture of it right here. This is this is the map that he Whoa. made. So, where, so where's the temple that, that that's out of the woods? So do you see, do you see the yellow yeah. ones? That's what was on display. Okay. The rest of it is everything that he discovered. How long? This took him three years? This took him three years. Yeah. It took him three years and he did it twice. He, he mapped the whole thing twice. No fucking way. Yeah. And what's crazy is, so you see the blue streaks? Those yeah. are those are artificial aqueducts. Those are canals that they dug into the ground to be able to funnel the water, to channel the water through the city. So they had their own plumbing. They had fresh water that, was con- that could flow next to their homes. They had pools. Like, I mean, I'm walking in the middle of the jungle, dude. There is a house like like your regular residential swimming pool is sitting there in the middle of the jungle still being funneled full of clean uh spring water um so that's me that's me inside of an aqueduct so they lined they would dig these you know so i'm 5'10 that's probably 10 feet tall or so so they built a foundation walls and a roof for their underground water systems like these underground caves so you can be walking through the jungle and they go on for miles like see all of these blue uh, all these blue streaks, these yeah. are all artificial aqueducts. And so the one that I'm standing in is probably somewhere out here off to the... No, no, no. It's somewhere out here, actually. Mm. And so <clears throat> I could walk through that for miles. It's a tunnel full of clean water that's flowing that's flowing under the ground. That They, they artificially created that because they were like, no, I want to build my temple over here. So we're going to take this stream and we're going to build an artificial river all the way over here. And then we'll build it all the way down here because, you know, it has to go to another stream at some point. So it goes back into circulation. So they build it where it connects to their home and then it, and then the water would flow through their home down to some other river and it would connect back to the main source of water. So you're walking through the jungle and you start hearing rushing water and you look around and you're like, what the heck? And you look down and there'll be like, 
these limestone blocks. And look at these blocks too. There's no mortar in between them. Uh, of course, these things are heavily eroded. I mean, heavily eroded. You can see what water and rain has done to them, how much it's, how much has softened down the sides of this limestone. Um, but you're walking through the jungle and you hear rushing water. You look down, you see a block, you scoop out like some of the dirt and moss, shine your flashlight down, and there's a river under, an artificial river that's encased in limestone blocks rushing underneath you. These are found, like, dude, you could be, I could be walking through the middle of the jungle and uh, a perfect way to, uh, like a, a way that I could find a city theoretically, uh, which is something I, I want to do someday is I could be walking through the jungle and one big sign is you got to keep looking at the ground. And when you see blocks that are placed artificially, you may not be actually at a city. You may be standing above an artificial aqueduct that will lead you straight to that city. So theoretically, instead of trying to follow the, the roof of the aqueduct back to the city, you could pull off those casing stones that are on top, jump down on the aqueduct, you know, look which way is it flowing? It's flowing this way, let's go this way. And you, you could walk underground straight to a city in the middle of the jungle and come out right where I'm at, boom, inside of a city that no one's ever seen, in the middle of the jungle. And to give you an idea of how, oh, here's a pyramid that I jumped down in, inside, or a temple I jumped down inside of. So these structures out here get, get sunk in so easily due to soil deposition and how much it rains. So what I'm looking at right now, this, this right here is the roof of a temple but I thought it was I thought it was an underground chamber when I first saw it. So I jumped down inside, <clears throat> and you can see like look at look at how symmetrical the the interior of it is. I mean, it's trapezoidal and everything. And and I had to put my I had to put my hand up. So this is a tall ceiling. So I was thinking, oh, this is super cool. This is an underground chamber I just jumped into. Well, I get back home, I start studying um, I start studying Maya architecture. These this was never built to be underground. This was above ground and the ground has risen all around it. So this, mm. so this temple was completely underground. Right. And it's not like that happens to all um, structures. It's just kind of depending on where, like how is it sitting on the hillside? It, it's, a, it's a case by case basis. So I thought that was pretty cool. This is me standing in front of a temple in the middle of a jungle. Um, <clears throat> so this is the temple of Lady Sakuk, who was uh, Pakal's mother. This isn't on display for like regular tourists to go see. You have to actually just walk straight into the jungle to go find it. So Dr. Barnhart took me here. This is in January. Um, what kind of <clears throat> animals are out there that you got to deal with? <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're, I'm getting Dude, to that how, too. You got to come full, like, <clears throat> fully armed? Um, you can't be armed because they don't let you have uh, guns or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> so I have, a, I have a little folder here for a lock and don. Okay, so the biggest thing is a ferdolance snake. Can you see a ferdolance in here? No, I, see, I don't see shit. <laughs> yeah, see yeah. Just sticks okay. and leaves. So here's the next one. Can you see the fertilance in I there? I see it there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then wow. And then so so that thing is super fucking so, camouflage. Yeah, yeah. This is like it's the most overpowered snake on the planet because it would be easier to see if it was a solid black snake like a black mamba, mm -hmm. but this guy is dark and light brown with very dark brown. Uh, with a very like some dark brown patches that make it look like leaves so it looks like dirt with leaves on top of it and they're ambush predators so they so they'll sit in one spot all day long and they don't they're uh, like their fight or flight they're gonna fight they're gonna strike at you multiple times so they sit down coiled in a spot underneath all the foliage and you're walking through boom bite you on the ankle these guys are so venomous, so much more venomous than snakes in North America. Um, you have to get medical treatment. There's, there's, um, there's just no way that a Westerner is going to go down there, get bitten by a fertilance, and if you don't get medical treatment, you're not going to live. However, there are people in Guyana, in the Amazon, so that's the Northeast Amazon, and there are, there are Peruvian indigenous people. Um, again, this would be something interesting if, if Paul knows anything about this. Um, there are Peruvian people who have been bitten by fertilance snakes and they don't go get treatment because they just can't afford it. For whatever reason, they go back, they go back to their, um, village, wherever they live. They do their herbal remedies or whatever kind of indigenous remedies that are, you know, that they have, they live through it there. And, uh, same thing with rabies. There are ancient Peruvians who, who have been, I guess they've been getting rabies for like thousands of years. 
they've learned their either their immune system has learned to defend them from rabies or they've learned like these indigenous cures that modern day scientists just haven't gone in to figure out like what are you guys doing to cure rabies mm. um but yeah i mean like your your average person getting bit by a ferrolance in the middle of the jungle in central america I mean, yeah, you've got to get immediate medical treatment um, within, you know, just a few hours if you want to save the limb that's bit. If it's your finger, forget about it. You're going to lose your finger. Um, no, probably no matter what. Um, toe, you're probably going to lose your. You're probably going to lose your toe. So, you know, when I like when when Paul says, uh, I, I, maybe it was on this podcast, he says uh, he was like he's like he's like you take off your you take off your heavy boots and your weak little pathetic feet and you start walking through the jungle and I'm thinking like man, that's brave. But I wonder if the people who have been living out there so like when i'm in this area it's the maya people that i'm around dude they're walking around in sandals barefoot they're through the jungle no big deal um and so i wonder you know there's got to be some kind of uh there's got to be something that they're tapped into as to as to how they walk around the jungle how mm. to be safe that a guy like me some gringo romping through the jungle i'm not going to think about that or, or even be aware of it but this is one of the dangers. Uh, Ferdilance, I would say, is like number one natural danger. Your other danger is going to be a jaguar. But if you're going in with a group of people, a jaguar is not going to do anything to you. Uh, like in Belize, um, near the site of La Milpa, this is in northern Belize, the program for Belize. It's like a really uncharted uh, area of the jungle that's being studied. <clears throat> when Dr. Barnhart was out there, there was this young girl who was like a runner. And so people were like, don't go running down the roads by yourself. And she didn't listen to them. So she ran down the road and goes down this little path to go see this temple that they've been excavating on their own. And then she's going to run back in the morning for the breakfast. Well, there's a jaguar inside the temple when they go there. Uh. And so she like sees the jaguar and she starts slowly walking back. And the jaguar stalked her right behind her on the road all the way from the archaeological site back to the camp and then when there were more people it runs off in the jungle wow but dude. um a jaguar uh, would maybe be a threat but more realistically definitely not just the fertile ant snake i mean there's like there's like rattlesnakes and stuff that are out there that, that can get you and if you get bit you you should go get treatment you shouldn't stay in the jungle you know tell me what you told me last night about rattlesnakes yeah so there's there's a big myth about well and i mean I don't know that it's necessarily a myth, but it's like, you know, if you get, if you get bitten by a rattlesnake, um, in like a, a meteor part of your body, you know, like a fleshy part of your body, like your calf or your thigh or something like that, um, you don't necessarily need to go get medical treatment. You can survive that. You can take like multiple Benadryl a day and sleep it off for a week. I mean, cowboys were doing this back in the, you know, back in the, in the wild west, they were getting bit by rattlesnakes and they would have to sleep it off. And, uh, and a rattlesnake wasn't a death sentence. If you get bit on your finger, you're probably going to lose your finger. You know, you get bit on your toe, probably going to lose your toe. There are certainly people who died from rattlesnake bites. A lot of people are allergic to their venom. But if you're not allergic to it, you're a healthy, fully grown male or female, you're going to live. You're, you're not going to die. A ferdilance or coral snake bite is going to kill you. There's, they're like three times as venomous at, at, at least. Um, so in North America, we're pretty safe from snakes other than a coral snake. You don't want to get bit by a coral snake. But they have little tiny mouths, and it's unlikely that they're going to bite you. How venomous are coral snakes compared to fertile ant snakes? Uh, I believe basically exactly the same. I think a coral snake is is like, um, I think a coral snake is just slightly more, like maybe a couple percentages more venomous, um, but not nearly as dangerous. Like if you look up most dangerous snakes in the world, the coral snake isn't going to be on there. If you look up most venomous snakes in the world, the coral snake will be on there. But a coral snake, you could pick one up in the wild and hold it. You basically have to like press it against you to get it to bite you. You know, you really have to do something. Uh, you have to either be really unlucky or very negligent. Like I've seen videos of people playing with coral snakes and then they get bit. Um, but it's not as, it's not nearly as dangerous as this guy. Probably a rattlesnake is, is more dangerous because a rattlesnake's more likely to bite you than a coral mm. snake. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, I learned this when, uh, I went through EMT school, um, two years ago or three years ago, um, when I was still in college. And that was like one of the, that was like one of the big myths that our instructors taught us about. Really? Yeah. And then my, 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 uh, 
one of my best friends, he actually pursued EMT more so. Like I never officially worked. I went on some, uh, like you have to go through your rotations where you're actually working on the ambulance. But he went through, uh, he actually worked for, I don't know, I think it's like six months as an EMT. Saw all kinds of stuff, saw all kinds of snake bites. And yeah, every single person at the hospital, every person working there, all attested to the fact that a rattlesnake bite won't kill the average person. It'll just, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, um, a black widow bite. You're going to have a, a fever of like 106 degrees for three days and you'll get over it. It's not going to, even you. if you don't get the antivenom, it won't kill you. Nope. Yeah. Just Benadryl and get some good night's sleep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can, you can survive in central America. No, you're going to die, you know? Um, so that's, that's a real danger out there. Now the other dangers. Yeah. You brought up that, you brought up the scene from that movie, <clears throat> the lost city of Z where the guy gets bit, right? Oh, Apocalypto. Apocalypto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. What it was. that's what it was. <laughs> so, like, yeah, Apocalypto, the Aztecs are chasing the that poor Maya guy through the jungle, and they go around this tree, and there's a giant fertile ants there. So, fertile ants, they range in all different sizes. So, you can have little small ones, or you can have some that are, like, eight feet long that are super that are super thick but the attacks don't usually come from giant fertile ant snakes because they know that just a strike will be enough like a dry bite will be enough to get you to run away smaller fertile ant snakes are really scared they're not mature enough they haven't lived that long they're going to give you all of their venom and so there are rangers in costa rica like costa rica is where by far where the most snakes get or by far where the most people get bitten by fertile ant snakes um and um uh, yeah, I mean, there was a ranger out there who died in 10 minutes after getting bit by one. But I would fare to guess that he was allergic to the venom. I mean, that mm -hmm. that would make the most sense to me. Um, then there are people who they don't get they don't get their bites ever treating, but their um, their leg dies and it like uh, the necrosis sets in and it becomes like this black piece of charcoal bone that's attached to their body like their the rest of their body will will get over it and will survive but that leg is gone mm. so there's a wide range of what could happen some of the other dangers uh, going through the jungle are wild boar you know you, you don't you don't want to get gored by pigs that are out there although i don't think that that's that common um you know of course jaguar puma are are out there as well they're more aggressive than a jaguar like a jaguar is going to usually leave if somebody if somebody's out there they're very elusive a puma is more likely to be to stay and be around human beings and defend its home um <clears throat> although i've never seen one i've never seen a jaguar either um and another danger would be killer bees that are in the that are in the jungle and oh, yeah, so we talked about this last night yeah and so you know I, I i think the way the story goes is they're trying to make very docile bees so they take they take your average honeybee they take your african bee both of them are very docile species they try to breed them together who tried to do this I don't know some some lab in, in some lab in in Central America or South America, uh, probably Central America I think, uh -huh. and um, and it may have been multiple. I, I think it was people maybe all across the world that were doing this, um, but I think that somewhere it didn't work, and uh, this is either in Central or South America, and these these Africanized honeybees, which is what they're called. Um, escaped this laboratory and now they're roaming through the jungles like like many different brigades of these uh africanized honeybees roam through the jungles in in packs of millions and, and you for some reason they're not as <clears throat> like docile as the honeybees or the African oh bees. yeah yeah they're like they're like bees from hell yeah they they sting and attack you and will relentlessly attack you. And they'll, they'll chase people for half a mile. Like you can sprint as fast as you want and for half a mile, they're gonna be right there behind you chasing you. They'll get up under your clothes, crawl on your skin, sting you however they can. Um, it, say, say this is a problem that could, that could arise. So say I'm taking a team into the uh, middle of the jungle outside of Yashilan, which is what I intend to do. I've got some photos of it. Um, and so, Say I'm, say I'm taking people out in the middle of the jungle at Yashilan and you hear this, like you hear this millions of, of Africanized bees. What is that you're, thunder? That is thunder. Oh, <laughs> what you're, what you're, what you're suggested to do is to run and dive underneath the bush because I guess, you know, for some reason, these bees don't want to get inside. Like they're not going to swim around in the thick bush to sting something that's underneath it, right? They're not going to come that close mm -hmm. to the to the forest floor well <clears throat> the problem with that is if you run and dive underneath the bush 
that's where a fertilant snake likes likes to sit or that's where any other type of snake likes to sit or spiders or whatever you know something bad could happen to you diving underneath that um if i were to run if i were near a river you know that's um, what i would think of doing i would think yeah yeah in the water so there's the usama center river that's right next to it um it's a it's a big river that that is the border between mexico and guatemala Mm -hmm. if i were to just like say this happened right as soon as i walked into the jungle and and we get attacked by by africanized honeybees um you could run dive into the water and you hope to stay underneath the water and swim away and you come up at a place where the bees aren't there well the bees are gonna they're gonna hover above the water and watch you they can smell your pheromones or whatever coming off of your body your hormones they follow that and they will watch you underneath the water and where you pop up again they'll attack you again the other problem is the usama center river is infested with crocodiles you know and crocodiles are not alligators so crocodiles will intentionally hunt people they they stalk people they they hide next to local villages and they will stalk one person for weeks at a time and they'll they'll see their routines and everything they'll see okay this person's going to come I mean they don't know what they're doing but this person's going to come up to the river at this day and time and they're probably that person's probably washing their clothes or getting you know water that they can boil for fresh water whatever they need to do and so they will watch that person and they will basically plan or premeditate their kill and then they go up close to the shore they sink down to the bottom just underneath where they think that they can't be seen and somebody comes out there they come out grab the person pull them into the water um and usually it's like young kids like i think these are more leddy crocodiles so you're looking at like 10 to 12 feet long um so not the biggest crocodiles but it's a crocodile it's not an alligator you know the alligators that are out here in the everglades you can go slap an alligator on the tail and it's gonna it's gonna run off right but crocodiles are not that way um, so you go run into any swamp, like it, I'm, that could, you know, you could think like, oh, well, that's just a river. What if there's a swamp or something nearby? No, they're there. They, they've been there for the last mm. 80 million years. They've it's just been, death everywhere you go. <clears throat> yeah. In, in the Amazon and in the jungles of, of Central America, it's, uh, it's amazing that a civilization actually arose there that was as widespread as the Maya were. I mean, these are people who they had a perfect understanding more so than the Greeks and the Romans of our, um, like our, not our place in the cosmos, but, but the, the cyclical nature of the cosmos and of, uh, of the way that stars move the way, you know, where the moon is going to be in the sky. I mean, they, they worship Venus and to be able to worship Venus, um, requires a significant like understanding of, of astronomy. They would build their buildings. So this is something I've never seen anybody talk about. The uh, the temple of the the temple of the sun in Palenque was built by Pakal's son. It, it's right behind the temple of inscriptions. And every single so there's an opening, there's a single door that opens up. And the the temple itself is built according to the uh, uh, it's built according to like the um, sacred geometric number of, uh, what is it, uh, 1.6.8. Yeah. I'm sure Randall mentioned that. Yeah. Um, it's built yeah. perfectly a- according to that. And so the way the Maya did that was they would they would have ropes that were like, like cords that were a certain length and they would stretch it up, half it, and then they would build their, they would build their structures according to that. They got that from these local flowers that are in the area. And you see these flowers all over Maya temples. They realized that the flower was like a perfect geometrical shape and they built their buildings along to the geometry of flowers. And so like, it's common for Maya people to say the flowers are in our houses, the flowers are in our buildings, but they don't realize, some people today don't realize they're referring to sacred geometry. That goes really in depth, but the, the temple of the sun is every single aspect of it is built perfectly. And as the sun moves over the temple all throughout the year, where the shadows align inside of the temple along every single column, every like even the back side corner of the temple as the sun aligns, the, the priest that goes to in that temple can figure out exactly what day of the year it is. So the temple itself is like a calendar or a clock for our solar system. And it's, it's amazing the things that they were able to accomplish in the middle of a jungle where the environment was so harsh 
but yet they had all the resources that they need. It's totally counterintuitive to what old world archaeology says about why civilizations are born. Like along the Nile, along the Tigris and Euphrates River in the Middle East, and then the Indus Valley where you have the river that borders India and Pakistan. So those are like your your three great uh, fertile crescents of the old world, which all happen after after the time of the Younger Dryas, uh, the the North, Northern Africa, the Middle East, and the Indus Valley, they all dry up over the course of like four or 5,000 years. Civilization starts again. And, but it starts along, these, uh, starts along these river valleys, Nile valleys, and people have to come close together, so they build up, right? Well, in the Maya world, <laughs> I mean, they didn't have to do anything at all. They didn't need they did not need to build there was no actual reason to build the city of Palenque that I showed you. It's just pure ingenuity, pure creativity. However, maybe there's some kind of psychedelic aspect to this. They're taking a lot of uh they're taking a lot of the same substances that we know that the ancient Greeks, ancient Egyptians, all you know, these other cultures in the old world were experimenting with and then they meet gods like you know, Emotep likely took a, a hallucinogen of some kind. And I think he met the God Horus and the God Horus was telling him that Jozer wasn't doing a good job creating Egypt. And so he goes to Jozer and in, or in, in, in ruling Egypt. So he tells him, you know, you need to build something to honor Horus, blah, blah, blah. They do all these things in the name of their gods. Well, I mean, yeah, in, in Central America and in South America, it's the same thing, you know? Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a whole big puzzle, you know? Is there any connection? Is there any connection between the people in South and Central America and the people over there in Egypt? Is there is there any evidence that they could have known what anything about each other? No. So this is so. There's there's two things. Um, <clears throat> if there is, it would be the architects that constructed. You know, some of these very strange monuments that are in Egypt, they use these massive monolithic, megalithic boulders um, that have, it's, it's like they're completely devoid of, devoid of any kind of art, right? It's just these simplistic yet massive and uh, deceivingly complex structures that they've, that they've created and the things that are in... Uh, there's there's uh, one site that's in Mitla, Mexico. That's a that's a very well known megalithic site. But then you have your others that are in. Uh, I can pull I can pull another thing up. Uh, but then you have your other sites that are like Machu Picchu. Right. Um, there are similarities there in architecture. And if there was one overarching, so I'll just pull. Uh, let's pull up this. Like, you know, even even in Egypt, they weren't necessarily creating walls that looked this perfect out of solid granite. Um, and this wall go i mean this is this is one of thousands of walls that are like this but if this is created by a civilization like a pre-diluvian you know and uh atlantean civilization then sure i mean you you could infer that there's potentially some kind of connection that spans all over the world there's really weird sites that are full of these like knobs or nubs that are on these blocks that you see all over the world and people uh piece these little things together and notice similarities. And there are some striking similarities all over the planet. So if there were civilizations in ancient Peru and ancient Egypt uh, 12,000 years ago, maybe they did Maybe they, they did know about each other, but mm -hmm. your classic Maya and your dynastic Egypt, right. I, wouldn't, I no. wouldn't assume a connection. However, there's a really weird thing that goes on in the, that, that's in the Olmec world. And I'm going back, uh, in February to study this a bit more. If you would pull up Monument 13, La Venta, Olmec, there's... And, sorry, go ahead. You know, oh, keep... What were you going to say? No, I was going to ask, like, the, the Olmecs, they have a striking resemblance. They have. They look like they're African, right? Yeah, that, that kind of isn't... Um, so that column tomb that I showed you earlier... Um, they're like the king wasn't there, but they're able to, they're, they're still able to find biological material from the Olmecs and they're able to try to, I mean, they, they can still test the DNA of the indigenous people that live there. Like all the Maya people still live there today. They, you know, their, their descendants are still there. Tiwanaku's descendants are still there. Peruvian descendants are still there. So they test their DNA whenever they find tombs that are intact where the soil hasn't destroyed the grave or the biological material and mm -hmm. they test it. They don't find anything that, that results in being African. Really? But if you go meet the indigenous people that live there that have no Spanish DNA in them at all, they do look like the Olmec heads. They do have these, do they? they do have these like 
very peculiar round faces, big lips, big, broad, like kind of flat noses mm. um, that are similar to, you know, what we think Africans would look like. So, yeah, did you, so Monument 13, I think it's, yeah, click on that first one. Yeah, you might want to zoom in. Some of these photos aren't the highest re resolution. <clears throat> so this, these are, this is an example of like proto- uh, early Mesoamerican hieroglyphs. So it's tough to see from this angle, but around his waist, just to the left, do you see the foot that's there? That's carved onto the, uh, there's, there's a foot that's pointing down, like the heels at the top and the toes are at the bottom, the toes are at the bottom, right? Hanging off of his waist? <clears throat> no, no, no. It's like to the left of his waist. It's, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. But it, but the foot's like pointing down. Right. And then like over a on the footprint. Yeah, it's a footprint. Okay. And uh, and then so over on the right, you have some more glyphs there. Yeah. What's interesting about Olmec art is it's it. So look at that, and I, I'm not implying a connection here, but it's it is strange. How similar is that to if you guys went over this in the last couple episodes? How similar is that to Gobekli Tepe, in in its art? Because what they did is they carved the face off of the monuments to reveal the hieroglyphs and the glyphs from beneath. So they carve the face off. But what this means, this is a really, really interesting monument. So what what we infer that that foot means is, is it means he's a traveler. Okay. And then over on the right, the glyphs uh, spell out that he is a traveler as well. It's two different, um, it's two different like logographs or logograms that, that depict that he's the traveler. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> on the top of his head, that little poofy thing and yeah. kind of like the tail coming down, that is interpreted as being a turban. That's not his hair because all Olmecs depict themselves as being bald. So it's very likely that they shave their own heads. And ancient Americans were notorious for not being able to grow beards. They didn't like growing facial hair is like a, is like an old world uh, Middle Eastern thing that, that, uh, that I think that Europeans picked up through like insemination and then it came over to this side of the world. But a lot of Native Americans were not growing facial hair. Um, <clears throat> so he has a beard as well. He's wearing a turban and he's got these little pointy shoes on. Well, beards, turbans, and pointy shoes are not seen anywhere at all in, in the Olmec world. Now, this monument dates back to about 900 to 1000 BC. So exactly... At the same time of this, there's another thing that you could look up. It's like a San Lorenzo clay head. Uh, San Lorenzo is S-A-N space L-A-R-E-N-Z-O clay head, San Lorenzo clay head. Um, at Monument 13 was found at La Venta. This right here that's up on the screen now, look how amazingly yeah, like oh, intricate wow. that is. This was found at San Lorenzo. So La Venta is like the western most edge of the state of Tabasco. This is found in, in Veracruz at a site called San Lorenzo. This is, he's wearing a turban. He has a little pointy beard. This does not look like a Native American. What this does look like is somebody who lived in the Middle East. At exactly the same time, around 1000 BC, the Phoenicians are launching expeditions out of the Strait of Gibraltar from the Mediterranean Sea, and they are going to be the first civilization uh, of their time to travel all the way around the coast of Africa and back. So the, so the Phoenicians were excellent seafarers. Well, there's been studies that prove, and they've I think they've tested it with like mock ships that they send out into the ocean, mm -hmm. that if you go too far west out of the Strait of Gibraltar into the Atlantic Ocean, you'll be carried by current out into the middle of the ocean, straight down through the Bahamas, Caribbean, straight down into the Gulf Coast, right into Olmec heartland. So what's interesting is there's some evidence out there that there were Phoenicians who got lost at sea and landed in Olmec heartland and they're depicted on Olmec monuments around 1000 BC. And this is something nobody's talking about. Um, but we don't see evidence of that. We don't see evidence of them. It's very likely like they stopped in the Caribbean and they met with the Carib people it's probably likely that they stopped in the Yucatan before they ended up on the Gulf of Mexico. But at, at this point in time, the Caribs that are in the Caribbean and the proto early Maya people living in the Yucatan, one, we just don't have the evidence that, that they met up with these people and they maybe never wrote it down. Or maybe the Phoenicians stopped in the Gulf of Mexico and spent a lot of time around the Olmecs because the Olmecs are so much more progressed and were the only civilization that came across that were similar to themselves. Now, mm -hmm. whether the Phoenicians sailed back, we don't, we don't know. We don't have any evidence of because there's no, um, 
I don't think that there's any, um, well, you know, I, I'm just learning about this recently, um, that there may be a place that the Phoenicians spoke about that was, that was west out of the gates of Hercules, which is like the Strait of Gibraltar. Right. There's a place they spoke about that was further out west, but there isn't like, there's not any substantial, um, there's not anything written substantially about it to prove that these are the same Phoenicians that came back from the new world, um, from Mexico and sailed back over. So okay. whether or not they ever went back, if there were just, you know, there may have just been a group of 50 of these guys and they died in Mexico, you know, we, we don't mm. know, or, or their, their DNA is such a minimal amount that it can't be detected, you know, 3000 years later. But mm. yeah, this is a, this is like a really strong case for recent old world contacting the new world way before Columbus ever came. Whoa. <clears throat> yeah. Well, and actually I should I should clarify and say that there may there may be more information out there that existed at one point in time like, you know, when the Aztecs when we know that when they were writing uh, when they were ordering um uh, and producing about 480,000 pieces of paper a day, these guys were standing on the shoulders of giants from the Maya. The mm -hmm. Maya are the ones who really expanded uh, Mesoamerican, uh, like the, their calendar, their mathematics, sacred geometry, and their writing. And, uh, and we were the Maya again? So the Maya are, they probably begin around 1000 BC. Okay. That's like the very beginning. And then they flourish at about... 580, so like 1500 years later. And they really bring wow. everything, they really bring everything like to life. And then they exist from their height at about 500, 600, 700 AD. They start collapsing. They start moving from the jungles of Guatemala, which are like where all of the older structures are. There's some kind of drought. Maybe there was a volcano, something happened. So people start moving north towards the towards the top of the Yucatan. And so, the, so their architecture changes. They realize that worshiping men as gods doesn't actually work. So they start having like uh, divine councils of rulers. So they start moving northern, north into the Yucatan where they, they stay there from 800 AD to 1400 AD. And they're like fighting the Aztecs at the same time. The Aztecs were about to launch an assault on the entire Maya world as soon as the Spaniards show up. Oh, so, shit. <clears throat> for about 2000 years, when the Spaniards show up, around 2000, years the maya had been writing so if the aztecs were producing f almost 500,000 copies of paper a year think about how much the maya had written down for the last you know almost 2000 years and everything that they knew <clears throat> so what's crazy is in the four codices that survive so when diego de landa i think this is like the 1570s or 1540s, he's in Merida, Mexico. What is today modern name Merida, Mexico? I believe that's where he's at. And he gets all of these local uh, tribesmen, Maya people who still have their their ancient codices. So like what the Maya do is, have you ever seen the sticky notes, how they connect on, the, on like the top and the bottom and you can pull them apart? Yeah. That's a codex that comes from the Maya world. That's where that design comes from. So their books were, were folded like a zigzag. And so you like unfolded the book and you could flip the book over and read it the opposite way. And uh, so that's hmm. called a codex. It's okay. not necessarily a book. <clears throat> so um, he burned, according to, to Spanish chroniclers, he burned pyres of books. So floor to ceiling. I mean, imagine all the books you have on your bookshelf, how much knowledge in multiple pyres, if you stack something from floor to ceiling, how many books would that be? And you do it multiple times you could destroy an entire civilization's knowledge just like that. This is like the complete, this is like the burning of the library of Alexandria in the new world. The Maya knew very likely everything. They knew their whole, they knew all of their origins. I mean, what, what we have learned from the Dresden Codex, which is just one of the four uh, codices that has survived has completely changed everything that we know about the Maya. I mean, it's, it's, it, it taught us, almost everything about their astronomy. Uh, it, I mean, there are books that are this thick over, that are written this thick in small, fine print about everything that we've learned to do with Maya astronomy. I mean, they, they it's like a, it's like a book that unlocked, like explorers had, explorers and archaeologists had been looking at these temples and they can't figure out like, okay, well, why, why are these columns put here? Why are the, why are the cities built the way that they are? Um, you know, they, they're just looking at it and they don't, they just think that maybe it's all obscure. Okay. One codex, the Dresden codex added context to every single Maya city 
that was ever created. Like it gave context. People go, oh, so this this temple is aligning to the sun. This temple is aligning to the moon. This temple is aligning to Venus. This is why all of these structures are tilted slightly to the Northeast. Oh, and like every single Maya city that you go to from one codex has added context to everything. And then when you have the context, you learn, you learn some newer things. Like as you get deeper and deeper into it, like there, there, you might have a, I can't think of an example, but I, I've, I've been in that situation many times where this, if I didn't have this context now, I wouldn't be able to figure out one more step. So, I mean, dude, you're talking about, you're talking about tens of thousands of codices that were burned. That's everything that they knew everything it's just uh I, I feel like no matter what i say it would be an understatement as to i mean yeah it, it, this is on scale with the burning of the library of alexandria you know they egypt when people were coming into their areas if you had books and scrolls they would take them they would copy them down in the library and then they'd give it back to you when you when you left mm-hmm. alexandria well, I mean, yeah, the Maya are doing the same. They're doing exactly the same thing. And in their form of hieroglyph, if you could, will you look up, uh, will you look up like Maya hieroglyphs? You could just look up anything. This is so much more complicated than Egyptian hieroglyphs. The When you look at it, it's like, uh, it's like psychedelic almost looking at it. It is very difficult to wrap your mind around what you're looking at. And their civilization is so complex. Their language is so complex. Their hieroglyphs are so complex. I mean, a lot of times they're, they're carving the face off of the rock to l- allow the hieroglyphs to pop off the stone. And uh, you'll like, see- like negative relief? <clears throat> yeah. High, high relief? So this is this is just like a oh my god yeah dude. this is but this is nothing like a, if you look up like Maya Stila, um, <clears throat> but if you zoom into one of those glyphs yeah click on that first one right there zoom into one of those so each of those little glyphs is several words so you see how, can you see how the glyphs are are broken up into like four quarters right, sometimes right. so each of those are four are oh, four there are words faces in there yeah yeah there are faces in there there are temples in there there are animals that are in there it's it's like the most complex ancient language ever like most ancient languages are lines you know they're they're this is lines far and dashes. more advanced than egyptian hieroglyphs that you see far far and this is a this is a simple uh example of this i mean if you look up like a maya hieroglyphic stela if you spell stela s-t-e-l-a um or yeah l-a mm-hmm. um you're gonna see some stuff that's just mind-blowing i mean it's hard to even understand <clears throat> what you're looking at yeah maybe uh click on the third one <clears throat> that's probably copan yeah 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 so uh any of those if you if you click on them i mean Look, look at that. Those are, those are glyphs that are carved into the side of a monument. So it's like that, that, so this is at Copan in Honduras, I'm pretty sure. So they're carved steel. like out of it. These aren't just, these aren't just like someone took a chisel and started making lines on a rock. Yeah. This is like amazing three yes. dimensional. Yeah. It's, it's three dimensional carving. It's the, it's very likely the king or ruler's face. And that's probably a, uh, that's probably a depiction of the, so some of these are, are depictions of, of trees, animals, and jungle foliage that's around him. Yeah. And those, so you have his face that's in the middle surrounded by the world that was around him. And it like fades into the hieroglyphs that are on the side of the stela as well that tells the story of his life his rule and mm. the city around him and so you look at these things and they're otherworldly dude and and all the books that that were produced in this city were either burned to ash just smoke or Sometimes they're not preserved uh, very well because their tombs were prematurely open up opened up oh, like wow go to that one above up there mm-hmm. not that yeah that one that one yeah yeah, so I think that's Copan as well. So it's um, it's a it's amazing, man. I mean, uh, oh, if you look and see it, if you look and see at the bottom left, you can see a flower right there. So a lot of this is a lot of this is alluding to yeah. sacred geometry. There's a flower on the right that's a five starred flower. Yep. that's alluding to the worship of Venus. So as Venus makes loops in the sky, mm-hmm. it creates the five sided star. So the five sided star is not seen anywhere in the ancient world except for ancient civilizations that were aware of Venus because where Venus appears in the night sky, it creates, 
it creates like a five-sided star but you can't see it you can't see it obviously you have to know where venus is going to be and track it and so over the course of a year uh, maybe maybe it's multiple times in a year venus creates a five-sided star so any ancient civilization that knows about a five-sided geometric shape follows venus which means that they were very advanced astronomers uh, it's 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 freaking crazy bro so in the center of the jungle is where you're going to find in the deepest parts of the jungle is where you're going to find the most uh you're going to find the oldest you're going to probably find in some ways the most advanced structures because as maya civilization continues after the after like the fall because they fall in about 750 a.d but they're not conquered by spain how do they fall <clears throat> nobody knows nobody knows what the collapse of maya civil what what caused it could have been drought because they live like in the highlands of Guatemala and Southern Mexico and Honduras, like up in the mountains. And then something happened to cause a mass migration north into the lowlands of the Yucatan. And that's when they started conflicting with the uh, Aztecs. Yeah, about that time. Um, and then the and then the Toltecs who live near the Aztecs come over into their land as well. Like the Toltecs helped build Chichen Itza, if you've ever heard of, of yeah. that site. Um, so the Toltecs helped build Chichen Itza, and then and then you know you have like these uh, you have these Maya astronomical observatories. Like there's one called El Caracol that's in the city of Chichen Itza. This is an observatory that's aligned to all these different celestial bodies. But then later on, I believe in the city of Mayapan, an older city, they build another uh, astronomical observatory, but it's not aligned to anything. It's fake. It's like a it's like it's hollow on the inside. They lost the knowledge as the time as the time went on. So how many civilizations do you see that in where they start out using the biggest, most massive megalithic blocks that that they can find? their their knowledge of the world around them is at a at an all-time peak and then from the very beginning it descends it doesn't get better over time and uh it's the same it's it's that exact same in the maya world as you see in egypt it starts at like a, it rises to its peak really quick and then falls and then by the end of egypt they're not building as many structures that lasted or stood through the test of time as the old kingdom or pre-dynastic or even the civilization way before that did, you know? Well, it's wild when you think about the fact that Cleopatra was closer to us than she was for the building of the pyramid, of the Great Pyramid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that like what, like what I was saying at the beginning is, is that is remote antiquity that we um, just don't know about. And, and a good example I'll give you for how little we know about the study of uh, Mesoamerica here. I'm going to pull up my computer real quick. Um, <clears throat> so in the Lock and Doan jungle, it's very likely that there is a lost city that is out there. Um, so there's a city that's never been found. People have thought that they found it. This is like an artist's rendition of it. This is called Lakam Ha. Maybe it existed around 600 BC. That's where is this today? Well, nobody knows where Lakam Ha is. But this map over here, this is the Lock and Doan jungle. This is south of Palenque in Chiapas, Mexico, okay. just west of Guatemala. Okay. <laughs> Out in the jungle. <clears throat> so this city of Bonampak that's over here that I have pinned, that's a very small necropolis that ha probably about maybe 20% of it is is excavated and, and on display. And near Bonampak, they know that there was a that there was a city um, that was involved with them. There was one city called White Dog that attacked Bonampak and like ran through Bonampak, killed their leaders and everything. That the city White Dog has never been found. The city Lakam Ha has never been found in the Maya world. So, but there is a lagoon that's in the center, that's in like the north center area of the Lakan Don jungle. So like Lakan Ha, Lakan Don, it's the same kind of Lakan Don Maya people. So it's called the Lakan Don jungle. So the local indigenous people, they call this giant lagoon right here, they call it Lakan Ha, which is very similar to Lakam Ha. So the only difference is the N and an M. But nobody has been out to this lagoon before. And a body of water like this in the middle of the jungle, I, I mean, it's... Nobody's been right there. Except for local Maya people that live there. There's no photo you can find of that of that lagoon lake. It's it's like a giant lake. There's no photo. Nobody's ever walked out there. And that, I would guess that we that's... We got to pull this up on Google, uh, on, the, <clears throat> on the earth. Google earth. Yeah, I can do it right now. You want me to do it? Yeah, can you do that? Okay. Uh, that's insane that nobody's ever gone out there. Oh, dude. Or at least nobody's ever documented <laughs> going out there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we're about to get... In. Oh, here's a drug plane that I found out in the... Uh, Whoa, in the jungles, this? this is the jungles uh, west of. So these are this right here, 
is the uncharted jungles of Guatemala where they know more cities are. Can you zoom out so I can get some better <clears throat> context of where we're at? Oh, okay, I see. Okay. So, so where we've been talking about Palenque, Palenque is right here. Um, How did you find that drug plane? Just randomly? Yeah, I just, I just, <laughs> I just like systematically like scour the area like through through GPS coordinates. Like I, I go in straight lines looking down to see like if I were to go out there, yeah. what do I not want to come across? So, so uh, just as uh, some reference, here is Palenque. This is the jungle of Palenque. Okay, here's where those three hundred some odd structures are. This is actually the full scale of the right. city that was unexcavated, all right? Got that it. jungle is literally nothing when you look oh at the other God. Maya jungles. So right here, the entire center part of the Yucatan is, I mean, look, there's no cities that really like pop up as you go in. There's these main little cities. Out here, this is uncharted jungle, uncharted jungle, uncharted jungle. Then you come down into Campeche, this is uncharted jungle. There was a city called Ocomtun that was found right in right in maybe this area, about 37 miles deep into the, deep into the jungle. Um, I think it was Ivan uh, Sprock that just found that city. Uh, the lower part of Campeche is completely uncharted. The northern Paten jungle in Guatemala, look, there's almost nothing that pops up. That's like, dark green. <clears throat> oh, it's dark green. This is this is where the earliest, some of the earliest sites in Maya history are going to be in this deep jungle. Even the things that pop up, like Dos Lagunas, if I were to zoom in here, there isn't actually anything here. There's a There's an airport... There's an airport, and this is probably like a, uh, this could be like a wildlife research institute. This is where some of your uh, like bee, like colony beekeepers, people who study bees. So if something gets out, it doesn't like immediately attack, attack the local community. <laughs> like there's all kinds of stuff like that out there. Oh. The vast majority of this is completely uncharted. So recently there was a, um, recently there was a, a LIDAR thing that, that made news um, that showed 60,000 structures that were found in the jungle. So this I'll, is right where we were just looking. Yeah, it's on the southwest side of where we were looking. So this is a this is like an artist rendition kind of of the lidar scan. They they like beef it up and and give you an idea of what it would really look like. Uh -huh. Okay, to give you an idea of how of how much of how little we know, we did not know about those sixty thousand structures until within the last several years. They run lidar scan over it, and then when they do lidar scan, they realize just how much is out there. Okay, I'll show you. Because a guy went out there, a guy that I know went out there on uh, and did a Google Street View of the city. He walked out there. Okay, so here's the entire what? here's the entire jungle. All right, this is where the city is, just right here. In the look look at how far in that is. I'll, I'll measure it real quick. Um, Some guy mapped all those roads with a Google camera. Yep. Well, well, yeah, like by hand, you know. Right, um, like the cars typically have them mounted to the roof, but this guy was <laughs> carrying one. Yeah, yeah, and so so from right here. To about right here, five miles into the jungle. That's it. And we had no idea that 60,000 structures were there. So we click on, oh, I was actually a little bit further. So maybe it's like four and a half miles. So then we come in and we click right here. Stop it. And now, oh look, my. At, look at that giant pyramid. This is probably 60 feet tall and there's a temple at the top of it. <clears throat> so you can see the stairways coming through. Holy These are Fuck, dude. These are in the center of the jungle. This was only five miles deep, bro. Look at how much. Look at how much is uncharted. <clears throat> look at that. All of that is uncharted. All of that is uncharted. Even the western side of Belize, it's all uncharted. There's stuff like that everywhere, bro. Everywhere, literally everywhere. It's <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> so down here. So let's go back to Bonham Park. So there's actually a street view here at Bonham Park too, and you can get an idea of. Dude, how do these oh. guys do this with these street view cameras? I don't know. You get like a 360 you camera. Just hit up and Google you can, and like, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna walk out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, oh, so this is from inside one of the tombs. These are the murals on the inside oh my of Bonham Park. So some of these depict uh, this, like obviously depicts. So I stood here in January. Um, so some of these depict the... Um, wow, look how glossy like, that is. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. I, I'm trying to get one that's like on the outside, out in the middle of the courtyard. So just the courtyard has been excavated. Yeah, so look how giant this stela is compared to this dude. And this dude's close to the camera. Like when you're standing up next to this thing, you're like this tall. Uh -huh. And so th this thing is massive. So this is like the big wide open plaza. Here's some of, the, you know, but look at how massive this pyramid is. And those murals are in there. Now, this is a somewhat lesser, less impressive city, but often in the jungle like you walk out to the tree line and you peer off in the jungle there's more pyramids out there like nothing has been literally nothing has been excavated here so in these murals 
<clears throat> it depicts the city of White Dog attacking Bonham Hawk. It also depicts the city of Lakam Ha. Well, you come and look down here at Laguna Lakam Ha. You click on the photo. There's no photos. Okay, I've tried to Google it. The only photo I can find is like somebody who flew over in like a Cessna and took a really blurry photo a long time ago. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else out here. I go on Street View. Of course, there's nobody out here. Um, but there are villages of people that live somehow somewhere near here. This is something I want to track down at some point. Um, but they called this place Lakan Ha. How far can you punch <clears throat> in on that <clears throat> without losing resolution? Yeah, I can go real close. Oh, wow. Yeah. So if you look around like the edges, do you, there's nothing you can find? No, I mean, um, okay, I'll show you here. Okay, I'm just going to go on a rabbit hole for like two seconds. How, so. how wide mm -hmm. also is that body of water? Um, it's, it's big. Here, let's look. So let's do like length. Yeah. So it's a mile and a half. Okay. Yeah, wow. it's a mile and a half and then what, maybe like a quarter or three quarters of a mile yep. wide? Yeah, exactly three wow. quarters of a mile basically. So it's a huge body of water. So this very likely, very likely fed a community nearby that is not Bonham Pock. I'm guessing Bonham Pock probably got their water from this river right here uh -huh. and that there's very likely some civilization, some city, maybe the lost city of La Kamha around here, but that's as far as anybody knows. So that's something I'm going to track down one, one day. Now, as far as- How are you going to get there? <clears throat> Walk. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to walk from Bonham Pock. It's, it's not that far. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, right, it's probably like five miles. Yeah, less than three miles. Okay. But you're talking about you're talking about like basically impenetrable jungle going down. Like when you go when you leave Bonham Park, it's like a very steep slope going down, and then you've got to hit the river, and then you've got to you know go through. <clears throat> you have to go through the swamps to actually get there, and then we'll probably camp out on the banks out here, uh, up a, up a little higher. You know, I mean, this looks like a pretty good area to camp out, and so, so anywhere around here, bro anywhere around here could be the remnants of a city uh i w i'm gonna guess it's gonna be a little bit higher up so like the elevation increases over here i'm gonna guess purely off of just looking at a ton of cities i'm gonna guess it's gonna be right up here on top of this ridge line um on any one of these sides but it's anybody's best guess but maybe if there's local maya villages out there there may be people who already know about it that that know a flying saucer <clears throat> oh god yeah imagine um, Dude, I, I would I would love that, and then and then they'd like lock me in a room forever, yeah. and people would think I'm crazy. Um, well, there's more sighting, there's more like UFO sightings in this part of the world than like anywhere. Are there really? South America and Mexico, yeah. Really, I didn't know that. Yes, it's yeah. really weird. <clears throat> that that is weird. I'll have to ask people when I go next time. So, what you were asking about when when you're looking in uncharted areas for temples, okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm filming a pilot for to pitch to TV, you know. Uh, TV production studio companies in April I'm filming this pilot we're going to the city of Yashilan okay in the city of Yashilan remember what I was saying a second ago about how a lot of a lot of uh, Maya cities are are oriented to the northeast uh, what I just said a second ago I was like I was like oh this is could because of the Dresden Codex we know oh this is why the okay yeah the right. buildings are aligned to the northeast rather than true north it's because of the celestial bodies that they follow so you look at Yashilan, all these are northeast. Some of them are a little bit more north because they're aligning to a different body. But look, all, the vast majority of these are all facing northeast. So what's interesting is, uh, let's go to my photos. Let's go to uh, Yashilan Expedition. So here's Yashilan. <clears throat> Here is a map that I was able to get out of a book that you can't, it's like a, it's like an older field study book that you can't find mm -hmm. uh, on the internet anymore. So this is a map of Yashilan and it's on the, so you can kind of see it right there. It's on the tip of this Bode Island. So it's like right up here. But there are, pe there are scientists who have studied howler monkeys because troops of howler monkeys come through this little peninsula looking thing to escape predators like jaguars and things like that. Mm -hmm. So jaguars aren't going to, aren't, maybe not necessarily, they may not come through this because it's kind of a tight area. They want to be out here in the, in the open and yeah, not they feel- sort of, they sort of like bottleneck <clears throat> this little piece of land and yeah. surrounded it with a river for people that aren't watching it, and just listening. Ex oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It, yeah. So, um. It's like a, it's basically like an island that's connected to the mainland by one sliver of, of land. Right. And so it's unlikely that jaguars are going to come through here. I don't know that jaguar sightings have been seen through here. And there were uh, wildlife biologists that were studying howler monkeys because when you're at Yashilan, I mean, you're hearing like the, Ooh. and I mean, dude, I was thinking like the first people 
tens of thousands of years ago who came through this area, when they hear a howler monkey, if you ever hear it in person, if you come down to Central America with me, you'll hear one howler monkey in person who's this tall. It sounds like an animal that is the size of a tree making that noise. That's how loud it is. I mean, it, it sounds like a monster. Like a demon. Yeah, it sounds like an otherworldly monster. It's 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 amazing. And when they all do it together, it's it's just uh, it's insanely loud. No video could possibly really give you an idea of how loud it is. Yeah. So there are these wildlife biologists going through the jungle here studying. Um, these howler monkeys and they're like dude there's pyramids out there there's temples out there they're all over the place they're everywhere we're walking over small little residential buildings there's giant pyramids out there there's temples that are out there nobody's ever been out there to look at it because like nobody's sane enough to do it for free other than me um so here's the uh here's a map of it now there's in this entire, so I read the whole book and it's basically like a study of the city itself. There's one page. So this is a photo that I took. That's like what the city wow, looks like when it's covered dude. up. Um, <clears throat> so this little building is a building where there was a, oh my gosh. So the very first suspension bridge in the entire world was built at this city. They built a suspension bridge, like, like, like think of like the Golden Gate Bridge, the Brooklyn Bridge. It's a suspension bridge that covers um, that, that crosses the Usama Center River. So they know that when, uh, when I believe the city of Kalakmul, which is in uh, like the Southern Yucatan, or maybe in, I think it's Southern Yucatan, right above Guatemala, they marched all the way down through Guatemala and they, they had to come through Yashilan because Kalakmul sacked Palenque. So they came down, they crossed the bridge, they made allies with Yashilan and they sacked Palenque. So a thing about the Maya world is we call them the Maya. It's not one civilization. Each individual city is a city-state. And just like Greece, who is at war with Athens, which Athens is also in Greece, and Sparta, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Athens is at war with Sparta. These city-states warred amongst each other. It's not just one civilization, it's multiple civilizations. And in this case, hundreds of civilizations that have their own lineages of royal families and kingdoms at each individual city. So it's not a straight line like Egypt is, like from Narmer and uh, the Scorpion King, the real life Scorpion King, 3200 BC, straight to Cleopatra. It's one straight line. This world is anything but a straight line. So they built the first suspension bridge. Um, <clears throat> and so what's, what's really interesting is somewhere in here, I'm not sure if I, ah, here we go. In one page of, of this, of this book, it says, Structure 88, this is people who explored the area. Okay. <clears throat> this is an old book. In Structure 88 is a small pile of rocks nearly one kilometer southeast of Structure 54. Structure 54 is the most southeastern structure of the main site. Bowles noted that the masonry terracing continued past Structure 53, but neither he nor Satterwaite continued along the trail to investigate the structure. Uh, this is a lintel that was found. So this is like a, a lintels. When you walk through a doorway, they knew that their hieroglyphs would get like a, would become eroded because it rained so much. So they started putting a lot of their hieroglyphs in the top, like a ceiling of the doorway. So the mm. doorway is like three feet long and you look up as you walk in and there's a, there's a, a lintel right here. So it's like a hieroglyphic piece of art at the top of the doorway. So they found this in the middle of the jungle there. And this is just like a uh, artist impression of it, but that lintel is still in that structure and nobody's seen it in, uh, oh, I guess it was moved. Okay, never mind. Um, I'm thinking of a different one, but so the lintel was moved. And so this is like the 1960s. So in 60 years, nobody's been out there. So it has no dates or glyphs. It probably rains to the, or, or probably dates to the reign of Makina uh, Skull the third or later. And so they knew that there, and as it says before, they knew that there were more structures beyond the structure, but they, they couldn't continue because the jungle was just too dense and maybe they didn't have the resources, weren't being paid enough, whatever. The only other people that have been, been out there are wildlife biologists who say there's a ton of stuff out there. Now, the reason I'm going to go out there and film it is one, when I would, I one, I just want to see what else is out there because I know something's out there. I know that there are more, there's an expansion to this city that goes along the outer perimeter. And I've scanned every little nook and cranny, every hilltop and valley on this little island. And I found something exactly where Dr. Barnhart and I speculate. So, so Dr. Barnhart and I look at Yashilan <clears throat> and we think that this is definitely a defensive, uh, this is a, 
it's a defensive geographical area. I mean, it's the perfect place to defense. You're surrounded right. by a moat, mm -hmm. but what's your what's the weakest part of this area? It's definitely the part that connects to land. So what we think is there's probably defensive structures or outlooks because back in in this world in north central and south america people had something called runners and it was these trails they built through the jungle and you have a guy running barefoot sprinting through the jungle to deliver a message and these runners could run uh, hundreds of miles in, in a short period of time or 10 dozens of miles in a, in a short period of time so what we think is there, there were some defensive structures that were higher up watching as potentially another civilization in their boats rounds these corners potentially to visit or attack Yashilan. And we think that up here on top, there were definitely defensive structures where, where a clearing was made, where you'd be able to see down into the river, it, very likely. So I go on Google Earth and I start looking. You might barely be able to see it here. For everybody that's watching, I'm zooming in on something on Google Earth. What do you see right here? Rectangular structures that are oriented just barely to the northeast. It's really easy to see it on my computer. Okay, yeah, I see it. I so see these it. are rectangular structures that are terraced off. So they have multiple different levels that are oriented to the northeast. Now this would be on on a hilltop. Is there anything else like this in Yashilan? And I'll also look. It's a patch where right. where the forest hasn't grown in completely around, but you can tell it's green, it's growing in, but it's not completely grown in. Is there anything else similar to that? Yes, the three astronomical towers at the top of Yashilan. It looks almost exactly the same if I put like a completely green filter over it and mm -hmm. all of these are oriented to the northeast. So it's the same alignments and it's in the, a similar geographical spot. It's up high and very likely there may be other temples that are a bit higher up on Whoa. these areas. So this is, you know, this it's Oh wow, this is ele elevated oh, so it's, it's much. it's yeah, it's extremely steep. I mean, this is a huge area. And so these astronomical temples are way up here. I I walked to these earlier this year. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, I walked up the uh so you come down here, you land here on a boat, you walk through the jungle. This is like the research station out here, but these guys never walk out into the jungle. They're only here, you know, they're only here among the main city. Or maybe they do, but they don't say anything about it and they don't have like a public Right. mouthpiece to really right. get it out there so yeah i walked from the across i walked from jaguars uh temple 33 here um as i was walking over to the acropolis over here there's a path that shoots up and dr barnhart was like if you want to walk up to the top temples you can take that path so i walked up there by myself really uh -huh. i walked up here by myself you're and, a maniac <laughs> and uh and um, so, yeah, I walked up here by myself and walked all the way through here. There's monuments and stela that are laying on the ground. There's, uh, it's very likely that that these have, uh, that these are constructed similar to the Temple of the Sun at Palenque. That these temples are also calendars in themselves, and they point towards different. Uh, directions in the sky to be able to tell the Maya people different things. But dude, it could take somebody like living at Yashilan for multiple years straight, going up there at every single, uh, at every single major solar cycle to figure out, oh, look what just happened. Oh, okay. Okay. So now we see that this shadow aligns here in six more months. Let's see if it, if it does X thing. Okay. If it doesn't do that, then it doesn't do this. And then you test it enough times and you realize, Oh, the Maya people were doing this. Oh, it says that in the Dresden Codex, but we didn't realize that. So all those books that were burned, think about how much is out there that is just lost to us and we have to piece it all back together. So the, um, but also the reason I want to explore Yashilan is at the top of the Usama Sinta River, um, I want to say right up here or maybe somewhere a little bit further south, um, you know, the, the, the smaller villages that are in here are, are extremely impoverished and they don't have, you know, electricity is very expensive in that area. And a way to make it cheaper would be to build a dam. So you have like hydraulic energy. And so uh, the Mexican government wants to build a dam in that area, but the dam is going to raise the water level and it's going to flood this entire, like the, the water is going to seep over the entire um, Bode Island of Yashilan and mm -hmm. turn it into like, a lake of some kind. So it's going to it's going to flood all of the temples. All of that that big round bulb yeah. will be underwater. Uh yeah, a lot of it will be. And all of these all all of this area on the outside will be completely flooded. So it's going to turn it into these giant lakes. Wow. Um where they can dam it all up and like have a lot of water power that's pushing through a dam. So they'll have like dams on two ends. 
And it's not just Yashilan that's there. On the other side of the river, when you're when you're going up the raft or when you're going up the, the speedboat up to Yashilan, you look off to the right and there are pyramids out there that are completely covered in foliage. Like um, Nueva Palestina is a great example of how little has been um, discovered. So I've got, I've got a photo of it here. Yeah, so this is a photo that I took. This is from the city of Nueva Palestina. These are called the Great Pyramids because they look like the Great Pyramids mm-hmm. in Giza. That is with an insanely extended lens. This is ridiculously far away from where I was from where I was uh, standing. Those are way off in the middle of the jungle, and there's no scientific study. Nobody's of them. been there. I'm sure people have walked out there, but there's no study. There's no photos I can find. There's not even a name of it. There's no oh, way to dude. Google it. So, <clears throat> so look at this. Uh, there's a little diagram that I that I've got that I showed when I was at the uh, when I was at the Cosmic Summit, which by the way we're having a Cosmic Summit again in uh, yes. 2024 that everybody should come to. Hopefully, you can come to it as well. Hell yeah. I um, plan on it. <clears throat> so, um, let me see. I've got a photo. Gosh, what was I? Oh. Um, How crazy is it that this is like the exact go. place where that enormous asteroid killed the dinosaurs hit? Oh, I know, right? It's 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 crazy. Um, so here, here is all, so all the green dots on the right diagram are the documented, um, locations of Maya cities. So look at how, look how densely packed they are. Every single area where it's a bit more empty, it's just as packed. That's how many cities are left out there. That's how many pyramids are out there. I'm, I mean, you're talking about, you're talking about easily over, I would estimate easily, easily over 10,000 pyramids have not been discovered in Central and South America. And so then, you know, you, you're trying to look for, you know, it's hard to find a lost city in Central America. So uh, here, I'm going to get the map clean real quick. You're really good at using <clears throat> Google Google Earth. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So here, I'll show this. I'll show this real quick. So here's the city of Bonampak, okay? Uh-huh. To, to go from here to over here to find the, the city of Lakam Ha or White Dog that might be over there. They think White Dog may have been found, but Lakam Ha may be in there. That's going to be a really tough expedition. <clears throat> it's very likely there's also cities in the Lakan in the Lakandone jungle that are south of Bonapak and south of the lagoon. So one thing, an example I give is like this road to this road from Nueva Palestina down here to Bonapak is maybe like ten miles or so. Okay, and I would say that that road from the north side of the Lakandone jungle it really starts about right here because all of this is inhabited for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, so the north, so this road that goes down through into Bonampak, I would say is is uh, metaphorical for how much we know about the Maya world. The rest of the Lock and Dome jungle is how much we don't know. And all of that is completely uncharted land. Wow. <clears throat> completely uncharted jungle. But that's also nothing to the compared to the Paten jungle that hasn't been discovered. And the Campeche jungle and the Yucatan jungles. All these little satellite things, all this is completely unexplored. Oh, not to not to mention the Maya mountains in Belize. This is all completely uncharted. Now, think about trying to find the origins of civilization in the jungles of the Amazon. How big and massive that is compared to anything that's in the Maya world. But think about all the stuff that's in the Maya world that's never been discovered. So you're trying to find a lost city in the Amazon. Look at that compared to this. It's I mean, look at that massive jungle right there. Look at that compared to the Amazon. It's it's uh, <laughs> it's impossible it, to wrap your brain around. Man. It's impossible to wrap your brain around. Yeah, man. It's like uh, exploring the Amazon is like exploring space. It's just endless, you know. It's endless and it's dense. And no matter no matter how many trails you cut, the trail grows in behind you. You know, like you 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 cut the trail down, you turn around, and the trail's already growing in and covering itself up. You come back to the same trail, you chopped down a season before and it's not there anymore how much when you're out there exploring by yourself how much do you have to worry about running into like loggers like illegal loggers or okay like drug smugglers because i remember paul rosley was explaining a story where he was like he was canoeing down the amazon river and he ran into like these dudes with a boatload of cocaine mm-hmm. and like they were like scoping them out and following him for a while so there's a lot of uh Oh, dude, yeah, this is a great topic. There's a lot of that out there that I worry about. I have not been exposed to it thus far. 
Um, but as over the next couple of years, I, I imagine I might, or I might see the remnants of that being out there. Um, so illegal logging is huge in Guatemala. It's huge in Southern Mexico. Uh, I think it's, I think it's pretty big in the Yucatan. Um, <clears throat> so there are giant trees. There's like Saba trees that are in, that are in the, uh, in Central America. So Saba tree is like the tree of life for the Maya people. Right. Um, these are ancient, you know, thousand year old trees. Um, so, but they're highly sought after and not just that, just any kind of log is, is highly sought after. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not only that you're looking at how much cartel activity is down there. There's a lot of cartel activity out there in the jungles. They've got their own compounds. Mm-hmm. So look, I found this in the Lock and Doan jungle, uh, as well. So this is an airstrip that I found that is not, that doesn't I love how it first I love how you can just basically look at Mexico and zoom into exactly these little obscure like details in like the split <laughs> second. Uh, you have this whole th- like country and you have all of South America perfectly mapped in your brain. It's an, it's really incredible. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, I'm like absolutely obsessed with it. You know, I, I like I can tell it. It's a. Um, in my videos, it's all I try to I try to stay like uh, I try to approach it with a lot of humility, like I'm you know an educator and everything. But this is a personal journey as well. You know, I mean, I'm trying to like build a life that's around the things that I love, mm-hmm. and do some things that are that are memorable and discover things that'll that'll last way beyond my lifetime. You know, um, so that takes a while. You know, I want to build. I want to build something that brings in some funds to be able to go on expeditions and yeah. do things that are that are bigger than myself and not something just to like glorify myself, but something to bring some kind of understanding to the world, to other mm-hmm. people. And the, the jungles of Central and South America are a frontier that's still accessible. Like the age of exploration is not over. I mean, I, I can prove it a dozen times over, but this is one of the dangers that, um, that I could run into. So these maps aren't really updated. I've been looking at this for three or four years and I've never seen it change on, on Google Earth, <clears throat> so this when was this last image. Like, can you see like what year this satellite image was taken? No. Okay. Okay. Well, no, I can. Is this 2020? April 11th, 2020. Yep. Okay. So, um, so, so that's interesting. They actually updated that. I haven't looked at that in years. Um, so yeah. So in the last three years, I was thinking I haven't seen this since 2019, but in 2019, this was still there. But I haven't really seen this change. Um, so this is an airstrip that's out there. But what's weird is there's no roads leading to it. So I was like what do they do? Do they go, do they go down the river? So you start following the river, start following the river. Oh, what do you come across? Drug compounds, cocaine, you know, they're, wow. they're, they're manufacturing cocaine, marijuana out here. So there's all this kind of stuff that's going on. Now, what's interesting is this might be an older operation because um, drug runners in the jungles now have created um, they've created airstrips that have canopies. Yes. So they, there's like one little opening where you fly in, but they like carve out a hollow uh, tunnel of trees. So so somebody flies in and they they land underneath the treetops. So and the they satellites fly can't out find the airstrips. The yeah. And so- uh, That's so, fucking nuts. So we go to these photos. I have some photos. Um, let's see. Lock and Doan jungle. Yeah. So here are some- these are some drug planes that just get abandoned. So if these places get busted, they just drive out or they walk out of the jungle and they, they leave, leave the these plane. they leave the planes behind. So here's here's one that that I guess crashed into the jungle because there's no airstrip around it. Um, but if you look long enough, like I was just I was just kind of going through Google Earth for a second yesterday or um, read it for a second yesterday, and there are other people who find planes in the jungles of on on Google Earth of, of Central America in the Amazon. Um, also refugees, like, uh, two, two other types of people that, that are, could be a danger. So Guatemala has a lot of like political civil unrest. I think recently they had like a civil war, uh, um, civil war, or they had, a they had a falling out of their government. I'm not updated on my, on my Guatemala politics, but, uh, I know that there are refugees that are living out in the jungles and they live underneath the treetops so that they can't be seen. They build little villages under the treetops and some gringo guy goes out there and, um, you know, they don't want me to be there and they don't want any risk of me leaving and telling right. people about it. They kill me. Right. Or I go out to, this is might be more common in Guatemala, which is why I, I'm not really looking to explore Guatemala yet. Maybe, I don't know, like 10 years from now when I'm more affiliated and I can take like a full on armed expedition with me. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, in Guatemala, <clears throat> there are 
um, the drug runners and the like, uh, yeah, I guess drug runners, they excavate sites as well to sell artifacts on the black market. So you go find a lost city. This happens in Western Belize near Guatemala as well. There are, there are, um, like black market looters that will come over from Guatemala and they will have machine guns and they will kill tourists and archaeologists who go out to these most remote sites in Belize. They will kill them and loot everything. So like in a, at a temple in the middle of the jungle, for whatever reason, I, I don't know the the geological explanation behind it, but at the corners of buildings, the way that the soil deposition uh, or disposition works is that artifacts will drift to the corners of buildings and sink. So you go to a corner of a building and you start digging down, that's where you're going to hit artifacts. That's how looters know where to look. It's just uh, it's just like one of the tricks of the trade. And I remember studying it more at the beginning of my degree, but... Um, it's it's a simple explanation, but uh, basically that's I that's the gist it, of it. That's got to be a huge source of revenue for the cartels. <sighs> Man, it's got to be. Um, you know the the guys who. You know what? Now that you mentioned, I remember Luis Chaparro telling me that 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 happens. Oh, did he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and now um, I can't get into it too much because I go down there. But um, now, yeah, the cartels and uh, the organizations that oversee Maya archaeology and, and projects um yeah it's the same people it's exactly the same people it used to be separated now mm. it's just the same and they uh well, i shouldn't say where they live i know where they live um like i know the city that it all comes out of um <clears throat> and like everybody knows the city as well so it's it, but um yeah it's it's nuts man so they're they're basically lawless at this point so they they're selling artifacts on the black market all across the planet i mean dude this happens in this happens in egypt like like zai Awas. i'll talk bad about him i don't care yeah. he's a horrible person you know what i'm talking about oh yeah uh he's a terrible person dude he he it's it's extremely speculated that he would oversee archaeological projects and he would have his own guys that would do it that are all bought out and he would take the finest um relics and artifacts that would come out of these digs and sell them on the black market you know that's largely why he lost his job as like the president of the ministry of antiquities it was well, also he's no longer the president i don't think so i think he lost oh, his okay. job i think i'm not an expert on on his life but ben I, was telling me that there was like some sort of like secret expedition they were doing underneath like in underneath the sphinx yeah and like a big temple that was oh, like yeah. under there that it was completely like black like nobody knew about it, it was <clears> done in secret yes yeah yeah well and uh yeah, that kind of made, uh, that story kind of made waves in the news because he's, there's a, a part where he's on like television and I don't know, for like a local news network or whatever. And, and he's standing in front of a tunnel, which I believe is underneath the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're like, what's down the tunnel? And he goes, down this tunnel? Nobody knows. We've never walked down there. I'm like, bullshit. Come on, bro. Right. But yeah, man, there there are, it's 100% confirmed that there are shafts that go deep beneath the Giza Plateau and go hundreds of feet down. But I don't think there's photos of it, but there are people who are certainly credible that have come out and spoken about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some photos that's leaked, but that's not something I dive deep into. But that kind of collusion and corruption does happen in Mexico as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it happens It happens at the top. You know what I mean? Like your average archaeologist that discuss that discovers something amazing and revolutionary in the new world isn't going to they're not like some dogmatic person because you're they're they're in a frontier you know in egypt it's not a frontier of exploration and discovery so people have had the time to sink their careers and their ego into this study so when somebody challenges it like you like you saw have you seen the debate between graham hancock and zaya was and not. how i've been meaning to watch that there's there's not anything to watch. They don't debate because Zahi Hawass doesn't even entertain it at all. He can't he cannot sit there and debate Graham Hancock, um, who's challenging Zahi Hawass's ideas and what his whole what his whole paradigm is is built on. Um, isn't isn't Graham banned from going inside of the Giza pyramids now? Like he can't go in there. I, or maybe I, maybe he just I think can't he's banned there. from Egypt. Oh really? Oh wow. Yeah, he might be banned from Egypt because in his new show, uh, Ancient Apocalypse, he doesn't yeah. go to Egypt, which you think he you would think he would, right, but right. I think he's banned from the country. Interesting. Uh, I because I only get that because I think he has said that on a couple occasions. But when he says Egypt, maybe he is just talking about the archaeological sites right. there. So there's no reason for him to go. I don't I don't know the details behind it, but yeah, I mean these guys they can't all the time stand up to the scrutiny because I think there's certainly guys that are in this alt ancient civilization community that 
that aren't right about everything, which is okay. But there's certainly people in the archaeological Orthodox community that that aren't right about everything. And to them, that can't be okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They're they're too prideful to admit it. That's one thing I've loved about getting to know Dr. Barnhart. He's like a rogue archaeologist as well. And he's very aware that that there is a lot of uh, dogmatic professors and uh, people who have their egos tied up in this Mm -hmm. in this whole study. And it just it doesn't have any place here, you know. It's got to be one thing to like see some of these megaliths in Egypt and other places that tourists visit all the time. But I can't fucking imagine what it must be like to walk by miles through the jungle and just be out there in this ancient city or site by yourself with nothing. Yeah, it's 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 invigorating. I I haven't done it to I haven't done it to that extent yet, but I have done it to a certain extent of walking you know, you walk a mile straight out into the jungle by yourself or with a couple other guys and you feel like you're way out there. You know, you can't hear people anymore. And uh, <clears throat> and it's it's like, it's invigorating. It's infatuating uh, being, you know, doing like little excursions like that where you're among like a group of guys that you're close to. You all depend on each other. If something goes seriously wrong, you all have to depend on each other. And you're looking for something that's much greater than yourself. You're, you're, you're mm. looking for something that that is like, it's like a treasure of time, you know, and it's been sitting there amongst the birds and snakes and trees for a thousand years. I mean, I've got something here in the pretend that I'll show you. Um, these little faces. So like you're walking through the jungle. These are little oh, wow. faces in the sides of temples that like vegetation doesn't really grow on. And you can be walking through the jungle and see these faces. <laughs> this is Piedras Negras in the, in the middle of the jungle in Guatemala. And, um, and, uh, not in the middle of Guatemala, on the west coast of Guatemala. That's and, bizarre. Is it rock around that? Is it all rock? Yeah, yeah. It's this is it's carved out of a. Got I think it. I think it's carved out of a single piece of rock. But okay. um, I don't think it's ever been excavated to that much of an extent. Like if you zoom in, you can see it has carved eyebrows. Oh like it, shit! It has detail into it. It's not just a flat. You know, it's not just a flat thing. And there's right. there's likely a giant temple that sits on top of this. So look at how much foliage has grown around it mm-hmm. but you're going through the jungle and all of a sudden you see one of those faces looking at you from the side of a temple you know um and it's invigorating being out there um and this has been something that's been true for the last 600 years that westerners mm-hmm. have been exploring this area they've been exploring the americas like on the lewis and clark expedition there were several guys who committed suicide after the expedition because they were gone for years and it was the it was the highlight of their life. It was so dangerous, but so beautiful and so invigorating that when they got home and they knew that they would never do it again, they couldn't get over the fact that they had already experienced the greatest part of their life and they killed themselves. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> like Percy Fawcett, Percy Fawcett was obsessed. He couldn't, he went to the jungle uh, like a dozen times. Uh, he was, so he's a British explorer. He went to the jungle a dozen times. Um, from England from 1906 to 1925 when he disappeared um, in the Amazon and he couldn't leave like he, he just he just couldn't um, he couldn't stop going back you know he, he was obsessed with it Franz Blom he he drank himself to death he's he's the most iconic Maya explorer ever he explored all the areas that we've talked about today in, in Chiapas and there's a book about him called Restless Blood and he was just restless like deep down he was restless because he was he was like chasing something that kind of existed but kind of didn't like he was actually chasing the feeling of being in the jungle and discovering something and when he wasn't there he had a problem with like alcohol mm. and there were things that would happen there were things that would happen that would prevent him from going back out in the field so he started drinking and he gave himself like liver cancer or something like that and died from that and so a lot of these explorers have uh have they have like crippling problems because mm. of how infatuating being out there is uh it, it's amazing i mean it's it's something that's like viscerally connected to the core of who we are you know what i mean yeah man uh, it's it's uh it, i've grown to be obsessed with it over the last few years it started in egypt and then it came over to the americas and now i'm at a place where yeah i'm i'm uh my page is kind of my online channels have kind of turned into a page talking about the ancient americas and all the lost cities and everything um <clears throat> and I, I hope to dive into it way more, you know, um, as time goes on and, and go on expeditions and discover things. I'd love to do the Amazon, but it's just so, you know, yeah, Percy Fawcett yeah. spent 20 years there and didn't, f- and he found some smaller towns, some pottery, some, mm-hmm. 
ancient relics, but he didn't find the city he was looking for. It took LIDAR to find it. But in in Central America, uh, I'll find something. I'll find probably more than one city if if I really commit myself to it and publishing it and talking about it, you know? Oh, don't you have an expedition you want to talk about that you're yes, going down? Yes, yes, I do. Okay. So uh, I have an expedition that is um, March 17th through the 23rd. Third um, of March 2024, we're mm-hmm. going to be going to Chichen Itza, Ushmal, Ekbalam, uh, Labna, Skitchmook, and in a set of uncharted ruins that are off in the middle of the jungle. They don't even have a name, and there will be a couple other surprises, uh, sites that people will go to with us. Um, the spots are filling up. A bunch of people from the Cosmic Summit uh, have have signed up. Um, they were the they were some of the first people that signed up, and then we've got Cosmic Summit coming up uh, next summer. It's going to be, uh, I believe, in Greensboro, North Carolina, and uh, you guys can sign up for that. That was probably one of the coolest ancient civilization events I'd ever really? done. Yeah, I mean, Randall's going to be there, Ben's going to be there, uh, Johanna James. There's a bunch of other guys that are there. It was probably, yeah, it was the coolest event with all the people who all have the same interests all came together and everybody from the cosmic summit still chats today like there's a giant so group cool. chat and there's a discord now that you that people can oh, check really? out and we all and it's got all these little subcategories i gotta get on that yeah yeah it's got all these little subcategories of different um of different topics that have to do with ancient civilizations so um, you gotta link me up to that discord yeah i will okay. i will and uh but yeah as far as uh as far as our tour i'm going with a guy named next have you ever heard of him next uh, yeah mm-hmm. um in EXT, he he's an American, but he lives in uh, he lives in Cairo, Egypt. So he's like an Egyptologist, like expert Egyptologist. Mm. I mean, the dude knows everything. Uh, but he's in the he's in the United States for a little bit out of the year, and he and I have gotten close. Um, we've gotten close over the past year because he also specializes in the study of the Maya. So he he has a company called Adept Expeditions, and I'll be. I'll be co-hosting a tour through his company, Adept Expeditions. The host is called Lost Cities of the Maya. So we're going to be visiting like the height of the fall of the Maya. So when they were building their last great cities, when they were at their technological, scientific, astronomical prowess, the, these are the cities that that they were building, and that's what we're going to be visiting. Wow, so, dude. Yeah. Someday, someday I got to get you to I'm come gonna down. Go, we, I'm, I got to get down there. Bro. We got to do like a group trip. Definitely. Yeah. Um, what about your YouTube channel? You got a YouTube yeah, channel? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you guys can find me on, on anything. So it's Luke Caverns, L-U-K-E-C-A-V-E-R-N-S. Uh, you can find me on anything. Uh, my social medias are really what kind of have taken off, but I'm looking to like really start pushing my YouTube. I think I figured that out, the format that I want to do it. You know, because I do like 60 second videos on my social media and I was thinking maybe I shouldn't do super long videos on my YouTube, but the super long videos are what people want. Mm-hmm. So now I'm, I'm shooting for 20 to 30, 35 minute videos. Uh, I just did one about the Olmecs and then uh, I'm going to touch on some of the topics we talked about here today in the future. Amazing, so. dude. Well, I'll link everything below. Oh, before we oh, go, yeah. I have something for you. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 what you give get? Me a second. <laughs> Oh dear. Okay, so this is. Uh, Did you loot this from one of the uh, no. ancient Olmec temples? No, but no, but this comes from this comes from uh, Palenque. For real? Yeah. So I I bought it at Palenque. It's handmade by wow. the people who are there. I'm honored. I can't wait to see what this is. Whoa, dude. Yeah. So that's the. That's the temple of inscriptions, and then that's the uh, a man's reach should exceed his grasp. That's uh, that's the final thing that Percy Fawcett's that's wife amazing, said to him before he dude. went missing. So that's the uh, that's the temple of inscriptions at Palenque. It's very similar to the temple of the sun that mm-hmm. acts as like a, a astronomical calendar for the Maya people. Um, but that's where that megalithic. Um, sarcophagus that we talked about earlier yeah. was found at the bottom of that pyramid wow dude this is sick. yeah so that's handmade by the local maya people what is it made out of um uh, it's like clay stucco okay. something okay. like that yeah but it's handmade by the people who are out there um and i bought that there's like a there's like a little market that's off to the side of the pyramid where mm-hmm. where local maya people make little arts and crafts by yeah. hand and i i bought that from one of them dude that thing is inc- that's so cool yeah so I was thinking it might be cool to, to go. That's amazing. Your... I wish I could. I might keep it right here. Cool. That's the coolest thing anyone's ever gave me, dude. Thank oh, you. really? I really yeah, appreciate well, that. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's. Um, uh, I also brought this. I gotta keep this one. This one's pretty cool. Uh, my. Um, so this is a uh, this is a as or I'm sorry this is a Maya Jaguar whistle. Um, so uh, the 
the Azte- have you ever heard of an Aztec death whistle before? Yeah. They show it on they showed on Joe Rogan's podcast yeah, yeah, yeah. once where he tried Calderon to- brought one brought brought yeah, 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 yeah. And he tried to blow into it and they can't do it very well. Mm-hmm. So the Aztec whistles, you guys want to look at that. So the Aztec whistles, um, the Aztecs would sit up in like the hilltops outside of outside of like their enemy encampments and they would blow the death whistle death death whistle and it would sound like women screaming or maybe like a like maybe it was mountain lions pumas you know how pumas when they scream they sound like a woman screaming well this is not that this is a jaguar whistle meant to sound like the roar of a jaguar so you won't should i try to do it yeah oh okay, yeah okay i they're they're like the maya people can actually do it well so you don't just blow into it because if you blow into it it sounds like like that, mm-hmm. but you have to cup it and release your hand, and it sounds like a jaguar going like wow wow. You, you, I'll, I'll do it. This is gonna be terrible. Okay. It go. It sounds like whoa. You know, like so if a jaguar is like like pawing at somebody. Yeah, so dude. Like, so yeah, that's but that's nuts. Let me see it. You can try it. So when they uh, so when they're out in the jungle and they you know I guess they wanted to scare people off, they make the sound of a jaguar to i guess as a defense you know that's what they that's what they think that that it was for so that's incredible so this is how when do you think this was made uh god dude anywhere from the 1400s to i don't know uh 500 ad somewhere around there that is that's probably that's probably this this is this one is probably not that old That is amazing. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, these are these are pretty cool. It's got like a, like the. Uh, yeah. Glyph what is that? A, what is, what is that thing on the side? Oh, of it? like it's, a dragon. Yeah, like dragon jaguar. You know. That's incredible. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty freaking cool. So they have a they have a lot of little cool stuff. But I just wanted to, I wanted to bring that to, do it on the, do it on the podcast. And I just thought that'd be that'd be a fun thing to bring up. You you bringing me on here, man. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this, and and I, I hope you know all went well. And uh, and um, you know, thank you. It's crazy. I really appreciate it, it. It was amazing, man. Thank you so much for coming down. Big things are coming, man. This is people are gonna their minds are gonna be blown by this podcast. I have no doubt. Oh, thank you very much. All right, man. Let's get you on your flight. Yes, sir. Thank all right. You. Goodbye, everybody.